Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for coming promptly into the room. Thank you so much, and thank you for those who are here on time. It's quite funny how this side of the room is filling up because we only have one access point, but there's lots of seats over this side as well. We have a really packed schedule, and this section is organized by Alexandre Maurice and Patrick Michel, who are very famous faces, and you probably know them already. We're hoping there will be time for questions. You can send your questions in online on the In Event app, and that's for the people watching online and for everybody here present as well. Many of our talks, because they're from various parts of the world, will be coming to us via Zoom. And we're going to start with the University of Tokyo. We've got Shogo Tachibana, who's going to talk about Hayabusa 2. And just to all of our speakers, hello there, I can see you, Shogo. Hello. Um, to all of our speakers, uh, the maximum time is 12 minutes. We're hoping that it'll be maximum 10-minute talk, leaving a couple of minutes for questions. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Shogo Tachibana, uh, University of Tokyo. I'm talking to you from Japan today. I really thank the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk about high status sample mission from C type uh, near Earth asteroid Ryugu on behalf of the uh, initial analysis team. I think you can see my slides. Okay. No. Slides, please. Hopefully, I, yes. Okay, so here is a list of key questions that mission aimed at uh, answering with the observation at Ryugu and also return sample analysis. What is C type asteroid made of? How did Ryugu form and evolve? What does Ryugu record about the solar system history? What was the role of C-type asteroids in delivering volatiles to the Earth? And the first question may relate to space resources because C-type asteroids have been hypothesized to be plant bodies of carbonaceous chondrites that contain water, organics, and noble metals with high concentrations. The last question relates to the origin of the ocean on the Earth so that the asteroid was named after the uh, undersea dragon palace uh, named Ryugu in the Japanese old folktale. Uh, the spacecraft launched off December 2014 and uh, explored uh, Ryugu from June 2018 to November 2019. This slide summarizes the physical properties of Ryugu uh, this uh, about one kilometer size the asteroid has a spinning top shape with um, equatorial ridge. Its bulk density is 1.19 gram per cubic square centimeters, which is lower than that of typical meteorite samples. This low bulk density and the presence of many, many surface boulders suggests that Ryugu is a rubble pile body. And its surface is very, very dark and the ubiquitous OH uh, hydroxyl vibration feature is found at 2.72 microns. This uh, border rich surface nature of the asteroid made it, it really difficult to find a good place to go for sampling. However, uh, with... Uh, Okay, uh, with very detailed and careful observation, the mission team finally found a suitable place to go. And the first touchdown operation was made in February 2019. The touchdown site is shown as TD1 in the right map. Uh, the animation on the left shows how the sampling system works. A uh, five gram projector was used to pr propose ejector and the ejector was then stored in the sample canister. And after the first touchdown, the spacecraft performed an artificial impact experiment in April, and the second touchdown was made in summer 2019 as the location shown as TD2 on the right. And this site was just about 20 meters north from the spacecraft made artificial crater 
So we expect to have some subsurface materials in the second touchdown sample as the ejecta from the impact experiment. Okay, uh, these movies show two successful landing operations. After both events, we confirm the firing of projectiles. And I like to emphasize here that these movies were made using uh, images taken by a small uh, sampling camera. There was not a scientific instrument, but a bonus one made using a public donation to support the mission. This bonus camera made actually a significant contribution to the mission and then using these images, we published a paper in science a few months ago. And the, The adventure to Ryugu ended with the successful landing of the re-entry capsule in Australia on December 2020. Here you see a beautiful trajectory of the capsule flying over a desert in Australia. And this is a photo of the capsule I took just after we found it on ground. <laughs> and soon after the capsule recovery, uh, the sample container uh, within which, oops, sorry. Um, go back, okay. Uh, the sample container uh, was ex uh, extracted, taken out uh, from the sample capsule, um, re-entry capsule, and the gas component inside the container was extracted on the next day. Then the sample container was brought back to Japan and then safely transported to JAXA curation facility. And then we started uh, preparation for the sample container opening. Opening, uh, It took uh, three days and a half uh, for this preparation, but everything was on schedule. Now you are uh, looking at our three-day activity in 30 seconds. Then, so the sample container was opened in the clean chamber system dedicated to Ryugu samples shown in the next photograph. Okay. Which is this one. Uh, the container opening operation was made in the vacuum part of the chamber shown on the right. And after opening the sample container, uh, we found uh, numerous uh, millimeter to centimeter size, dark, but very beautiful particles inside chamber A on the left and chamber C on the right, uh, which were used for the first. Could, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Can, can you see me or hear me? Is it possible to reconnect? I'm sorry, but we can't hear you and I don't think you can hear me either or see me. Can he see me on his screen? Do you happen to know? Does he have the playback of here? Ah, I think some, can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me? Do we know what he can see on his screen? <laughs> because if he can't see us, we, he, oh, he can, can see me. Him? Okay, so he can see me. So at the moment, we cannot hear you. Uh, we haven't been able okay. to hear you. If you can keep talking, we'll just see if we can reconnect to you. Can you hear me? Hello? Are you able to hear me? Just nod if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, we can, yes, okay. just keep talking for about uh, 10 seconds. Just keep talking. Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you now. So if you could go back maybe two slides just to kind of yeah, rev it up again from about two slides back. We saw this the... One. This one. Yes, yeah, this one. Okay, so what 
Uh, what slide you're looking at now? Okay, this one. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, I was talking about the samples. Uh, so uh, the first touchdown samples is shown on the left, and the second touchdown sample is shown on the right. And uh, I'll go to the next one. Okay, that, uh, the total uh, amount of the sample was five grams, which is 50 times more than the mission requirement. So I would say this is a huge success. And then after six months initial inspection in the nitrogen fuel chamber at JAXA, 6% uh, of total sample, uh, which is 300 milligrams, was allocated to the high upset to initial analysis team for one year uh, priority analysis. Okay, yes, and then team get these 22 individual particles, 11 from the first touchdown site and shown on the left and 11 from the second touchdown site, including the large one in the middle. And the grain in the middle is the largest grain allocated, which is the third largest, uh, third largest a particle among all the returned grains with the weight of 90, 90 milligrams. And along with these particles, we got 10 sets of aggregates samples and that consisted of uh, fine particles. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so in order to answer the key questions I showed earlier in this talk, the initial analysis team has been investigating the sample with different approaches all over the world. And we have six sub teams focusing on chemistry, mineralogy, petrology, and organic chemistry of Ryugu samples. Here in this mosaic, you see many, many smiles, and then that is a really good indication. So we are actually enjoying uh, the sample analysis, and we will be soon able to report the details of analytical results in our journals. Okay, uh, so this is my final slide. I cannot go into details of the results today, but I'd like to say the return sample well represents the Ryugu surface and Ryugu grains are composed of hydrated silicates and contain organic matter, like carbonaceous chondrites. And the sample analysis will reveal the chemical and dynamical history of Ryugu and the solar system. And I would say Ryugu and C-type asteroids are really good, interesting and important targets from space or resource perspective as well. The samples are now available for everyone who wants to study. So if you are interested in looking at Ryugu grains, please consider to write a proposal the first selection process is now being made and the next opportunity will soon be announced in early summer. That's all I have, I have today. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, sorry for the troubles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tachibana. I don't know, I haven't seen any questions coming in. I know we've run over time, so I might as well ask you as the experts here. I, I'm sure your interest has peaked, Patrick, if you have a question. Absolutely, there is a lot of uh, things to say. One, one question. Okay, so <laughs> no, just I want to congratulate, of course, uh, uh, Shogo and his team, and I, I was also involved in Hayabusa too, but the operations were yeah. absolutely amazing. And they, uh, it's a fantastic success, and it's really great to see these samples coming back and all the analyses uh, going along. So really, congratulations to the whole team, and uh, looking forward to all the great papers that will come out. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, and congratulations to you, too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Mutual thank adoration you. there. And that was a statement rather than a question. Exactly. Excellent. <laughs> so we can move swiftly on. Thank you so much. And we're staying with the University of Tokyo, and it's my great pleasure now to welcome, undoubtedly, a colleague, Hirdi Miyamoto, who's going to talk about MMX. Hello. We can see you, which is wonderful. Can we hear you? Okay. Yes, we can hear yes. you and see you. Fantastic. All right, great. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hardy Miyamoto. Uh, I'm a planetary scientist also from 
the University of Tokyo. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, the uh, organizers, the presenter of the Fox and the Luxembourg for giving me a chance to talk at such a great event. I really wanted to join on site, uh, but uh, maybe uh, next time, Kopri. Uh, so uh, let me talk about the uh, several future missions by Japan closely related to space resources, uh, such as the uh, MMX, the Phobos sample return mission, and some uh, lunar missions. The, uh, oops. Oh. Hmm. The, uh, the clicker doesn't work, actually. Uh, I'm oops. sure between you and the technical team, you have enough. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, we OK. All right, I agree. All right, thanks. So, um, the uh, first, uh, this, um, about the uh, MMX mission, uh, the target of this mission is two Martian satellites, Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is only 23 kilometers in diameter, has less than two grams per cubic centimeter density, and has a 7% albedo value, so it's a lot smaller than terrestrial moon has a significantly low density and it's very, very dark. The reflectance spectra are uh, generally featureless and are uh, similar to D or P-type asteroids. But its orbit is very special, almost completely circular with an inclination of one degree to Mars equator, 0.05 degrees to the local Laplace plane, and the eccentricity is less than 0.02. The, uh, these characteristics um, are very similar to those of Deimos, so Deimos and Phobos should be related in some way. However, the origin of Phobos and Deimos are still very controversial. Uh, they could be captured asteroids, especially if you look at this featureless reflectance spectra. Uh, Phobos and Deimos could be primitive carbonaceous asteroids. So uh, 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 the surface age estimated by the crater population are very, very old. So they could be survivors of planetesimals, which brought water and other volatiles to premodern Mars. On the other hand, uh, they could be formed as a result of giant impact, similar to the formational history of terrestrial moon. Uh, this hypothesis can easily explain the almost perfect three circular orbits. In this case, Phobos and Deimos were formed by high temperature ejecta from Mars. Uh, so isotopic signature of this impactor should be preserved on Phobos. So uh, just as the MMX mission is designed to clarify which hypothesis is correct. Okay, um, so um, here's the uh, outline of the MMX mission. Uh, the mission is led by JAXA, but is performed by strong international collaborations with CNES, DLR, NASA, ESA, and many universities and institutes all over the world. We have 300 science members, so we regularly have online meetings, as shown here on the right. Um, for this mission, we have three major scientific objectives. First, study the origin of Martian uh, moons by close-up observation and return sample. Second, obtain fundamental information on the planetary formation in terms of the low materials of Mars. Third, review evolutional processes of the Martian system, such as alteration of surface processes on satellites, the outflowing of Martian atmospheric molecules, and Mars atmospheric dynamics. Um, here is the uh, spacecraft system. We use a uh, chemical propulsion system, so it is different from Hayabusa 2, and we have a multi-stage structure with the uh, outbound module, return module, and exploration module. Uh, the mission profile is shown uh, in the bottom right. The launch of the mission is scheduled to be launched in the uh, uh, 2024. The spacecraft arrives in Mars orbit in 2025 and start Mars observation and also Phobos observation. We will release a rover to Phobos in 2027 before the touchdown of the mothership. Uh, we are planning touchdowns twice 
and each time we will get some samples. Then we plan to fly by Deimos before departing the Mars system in 2028 and back to Earth in 2029. And we noticed that the uh, Phobos observation will be a little bit tricky right? because the system is gravitationally controlled by Mars. So we do not really orbit Phobos to observe Phobos, uh, but orbit about Mars uh, in so-called the uh, quasi-satellite orbit uh, for the Phobos. So it's a little bit tricky observation. Um, the science instruments on board MMX are as follows. We have four instruments for chemical analysis of Phobos, such as Megane, a gamma ray spectrometer, and neutron spectrometer as well, as well supplied by NASA. And uh, uh, Orochi, uh, which is an optical imager with several color bands, uh, MILS, an infrared spectrometer supplied by CNES, and MSA, which is a mass spectrometer uh, spectrum analyzer. We have two additional instruments for geodesy and geology, such as Tengu, a telescopic image, and uh, LIDAR. All of these uh, altogether six instruments will be used for landing site selection and characterization. Uh, we have very nice rover supplied by CNES and DLR. The rover is basically a small spacecraft and will perform in situ important science independently uh, working mostly on the uh, mechanical and chemical properties of rigorous of Phobos. At the same time, the rover has a very important role as a scout. So we think a rover will be significant to prepare for the landing of the main spacecraft. We also have CMDM, which is a dust monitor to see if the dust ring exists near Mars and the radiation environment monitor and an outreach camera. Um, we have two samplers, such as a uh, coring sampler, uh, as shown on the left. Uh, so we, uh, we can obtain uh, deeper material. And we have a pneumatic sampler, uh, shown on the right, uh, which is surprised by NASA. It can contain surface material. So using both sampler instruments, we can safely obtain decent amount of rigorous sample of focus. Okay, uh, so it's a, um, this part is kind of summary of future Japanese activities uh, near or on the moon and Mars. Uh, the MMS mission, just I talked, is shown in the upper part of the slide as a kind of successor of the Hayabusa 2 mission as uh, Shogo Tachibana just presented. Um, as for the uh, moon, we have Kaguya, which is the lunar orbital mission. It, is, it was very successful. Uh, and that will be followed by the SLIM mission, which is scheduled to be launched in 2022. Then a LUPEX mission, which is a rover mission to look at the putative ice deposit in the polar region of the moon. And these are already um, announced by JAXA. But in addition to that, the, uh, we are planning a new mission called Tukimi for the lunar resource utilization. So let me talk a little bit about this mission. Tukimi is a, a partially funded uh, mission by Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Japan, with, of course, collaboration with JAXA. Uh, this is a water resource mapping project uh, of the moon by looking at the surface at terahertz band, such as 28, uh, 280 gigahertz and 490 gigahertz. The great advantage of this mission is that it can uh, obtain information about surface materials of the most uh, appropriate thickness, as thick as 30 centimeters from the top. So it can provide useful information for an earlier stage of the lunar utilization, uh, resource utilization. I can't go really in, into the more, much more detail by the time limit, but a uh, lot of activities related to this mission are just initiated. But the team members are basically scientists and space engineers, so we need uh, specialists in space resources. So if you are interested in this mission, please let me know, and we're happy to provide more information. Uh, this is a final slide, uh, just a summary of this talk. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so let me just put this slide and uh, very happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
thank you, Herdy, and I'm sure that people watching might follow up with some uh, applications, hopefully, to work with you. We have had some questions coming in. Don't forget, they're all online, so that's why we've all got our phones out here. We're not scrolling on anything else, I assure you. <laughs> um, is there any question you would like to take from this? So we don't have yet a question on this talk, so thank you, Herdy, for this uh, very nice talk, by the way, and uh, congratulations, as always. Uh, so I have a question, so about this Tsukumi, uh, is it a CubeSat or is it a spacecraft? It looks like a CubeSat uh, on your slide. And um, one year operation, is it challenging for a CubeSat or? Yeah, it, it's a little bit larger than CubeSat. So we call it still a spacecraft, but it's a very, very small size spacecraft, yes. Okay. Oh, by the way, congratulations to Patrick as well. <laughs> He's involved as a <laughs> PI of the role of the MMS mission. <laughs> OK, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Herdy. That's yes. wonderful. Moving on to our next talk. It's also online, I believe. It hasn't been confirmed, but I'm pretty sure it's online. It's from Sumeng Origin Space uh, with the topic, the progress of asteroid mining plans at Origin Space. Hopefully we have Sumeng coming up very soon. Sumeng. Do we have Sumeng? Not yet. So could we move on to the next talk, perhaps, I think it's you, which is okay. also online and come no, back to Sume? Ben Weiss. Have we got Ben Weiss? Have we got Ben Weiss? No. We don't have Ben either. Would Oops. it be possible to move to our on-site talks and go back to the online talks if, it, if that doesn't... Well, I'm, I'm here, sorry. Ah, that, that sounds like Ben. Next, but okay. Is that Sue? I don't know. No, that's Ben. <laughs> that's Ben. Hello, Ben. <laughs> 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 ben, hey, I, hey, how you doing? I Hi, have ben. a very small photo of you. <laughs> uh, great, thank you for hopping in. Um, thank you, lovely to see you. Nice ben, see from you MIT, uh, well, thank you very much. We'll try to get back to Sue Meng uh, from Origin Space, but Ben, from MIT, the floor is yours. You're going to talk about Psyche. All right, hello, everybody. Yeah, so today I'm going to tell you about NASA, the Psyche mission. NASA's next discovery mission, and we're launching this August. Our target is, let's see, there we go, 16 Psyche, which is a 226 uh, kilometer diameter body in the um, main belt at 3AU. It's got a bulk density somewhere between 3,400 and 4,100 kilograms per cubic meter. And so that thing is, is basically denser than essentially all Earth rocks. And we know its mass essentially by um, the way we typically know asteroid masses. That is by um, tracking its uh, interactions with passing asteroids and also looking at um, Mars's uh, position. And um, we also have uh, radar observations which show that it's basically got a very dense regolith um, and uh, high thermal inertia. So uh, assuming basically if we assume that it's made out of rock and metal and say volume, just porosity, and this indicates it's somewhere between 30 and 60% metal. And by comparison, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the Earth's core is only about 15 volume percent metal. So our leading hypothesis is that this thing is maybe a explore, expo, exposed core of a early planetesimal that had its rock stripped off by a violent impact. So what's interesting about this guy from the space resources perspective is that we, we think it's basically the largest iron-rich asteroid. And um, it's something that's accessible to a spacecraft unlike a planetary core, which we'll very likely never visit in our own lifetimes. And by comparison here, um, here's a picture of the, of the uh, sorry, sir. there we go, oops. So by, by comparison, it's maybe about the size of uh, Belgium here. There we go. Okay, so um, why are we doing this? Well, before I get to that, let me just say something about how Psyche fits into our broader understanding of planetary evolution. Um, so Psyche, as I said, it's about 220 kilometers in diameter. It's uh, representative of a broader class of asteroids that are iron rich, so for example, um, we have well-known asteroid 216 Cleopatra, which is something like 100 kilometers in length. 
And uh, we also have many other smaller asteroids of, that are similarly high density in the, say, 3,000 to 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Psyche is the largest member of this population. Um, and uh, we think uh, also this, this population of dense objects has similar sort of spectral features to Psyche. And we think many of them, but maybe not all of them, are metal rich. But Psyche also um, is, uh, is, is not alone even uh, at, in, as a large metal body. In fact, we think Mercury is basically, a, in many ways, a large Psyche. It's, it's, its core is something like 82% of its radius. So it's essentially like a core with a little bit of rock plastered on top. And its bulk density is somewhere in the same range as what we have for Psyche somewhere like around several, several four, four or 5,000 kilograms per cubic meter, at least uncompressed density. So we even have a, a planetary body that in some way is sort of like a psyche. And in the last decade or so, we've come to realize that there are many such bodies even outside our solar system as well. So for example, there's a whole class of super dense exoplanets. Here is GJ367b which is something like 80% of Earth's radius. It's cl orbiting close to its star, so it's very high temperature. There are also uh, Earth, super Earth bodies, bodies with radii great, greater, you know, ranging up to 50% larger than, um, than Earth's radius. And uh, they um, also have densities approaching mercury and maybe even up to, in some cases, pure iron. So it's clear that there's a whole, uh, there's a whole class of bodies in the galaxy um, collectively, collectively think of them as iron worlds. And the thing that's cool about Psyche is that it's sort of like the most representative, uh, the most accessible, and most accessible member of this sort of uh, collection of worlds. All right, so um, that's why we go to Psyche to understand these these iron worlds. And there's sort of three different things that we'd like to understand. So first. Psyche as an asteroid, like all asteroids, is a remnant of an early solar system population of objects, which we call planetesimals. And these are basically little planets. They were the building blocks of the planets. And, you know, as I showed in the previous slide, there's, a, there's you know, bodies even in our own solar system, Mercury in particular, that are larger than Psyche. And, and these large iron bodies is also like outside of our own solar system may have been formed from many psyches. So psyche is, you, is an interesting end member, is an iron rich building block of the planets. Second, if psyche is indeed the core of a, a body that underwent large scale melting, it's our most accessible core. We're unlikely to go visit or much less, you know, use the Earth's co core as a resource. Um, it's hotter than the surface of the sun. Its pressure is, you know, like a million times the Earth's surface pressure. We're not gonna send a probe to the Earth's core in our lifetime. Um, but we can certainly visit Psyche in just a few years, it looks like now. So. And the third reason to care about this is that um, we'd like to understand what metal worlds are, are like. And um, in particular, you know, what is the geology of a metal world? What's the geophysics of a world? What does an impact crater on a metal world look like? Uh, how do volcanoes form and evolve? What is, you know, what are the tectonics of a metal world? What's a, you know, what's a mountain look like? So it's sort of like just the geology and ge uh, uh, ge geologic evolution of a metal world as an interesting in its own right. So these different uh, broader goals translate into a variety of science objectives. I'm just gonna talk about one um, and sort of our defining science objective, which is that, um, yes, seems like, there we go. It kind of was a delay there. So the goal was, the goal is to establish whether indeed Psyche is a core or if it's unmelted primordial material. And the idea is somehow we need to explain why Psyche's density is somewhere between 3,400 and 4,100 kilograms per cubic meter, as I mentioned before. Um, we, our leading idea, as I mentioned, is that it was basically formed from a melted body that underwent uh, basically metal silicate separation so that its core formed in its center and it was surrounded by a rocky crust shown on the left here. The alternative idea is that maybe somehow Psyche formed from an unmelted body, but that body just accreted preferentially iron-rich materials. So maybe, uh, you know, somehow it, it got a composition that was not equal and, and much denser than the bulk solar system composition. So we're going to consider uh, the left idea for a second, somehow Psyche formed from this core. 
All right, so imagine you know there was a body in the early solar system. It formed, uh, it created. Because it had its uh, complement of short-lived radionuclides, so things in the early solar system formed with a lot of uh, aluminum-26, an isotope that had a very short half-life, but was widely abundant in the early solar system 4.5 billion years ago. It underwent melting as a result of the decay of this uh, aluminum isotope, and then that led to the formation of a molten metallic core, shown here in orange, overlain by a rocky uh, crust. And we see this happening you know, in, in evidence for this in, in meteorites as well as our observations of, of many other asteroids, this evidence for large-scale melting. OK, so then imagine that body was struck by an impact. And as many of you know, asteroids, unlike larger worlds, their geology and evolution is fundamentally sculpted by impacts because they're small. So there are a lot of other bodies in the solar system that are, have similar size or a comparable size to them that can basically do nasty things to them if they are if they strike those bodies. So in this case, imagine, it's not too hard to imagine that Psyche may have been hit by a catastrophic impact that stripped off its rocky outer layer, leaving that um, uh, molten uh, metal interior. That hot shimmering sphere of molten metal would quickly cool from the outside in because at the outside the space temperatures so you have this molten interior surrounded by this gray solid exterior. And um, what's you know, a distinctive a uh, aspect of cooling planets is that if they have a conducting a molten interior, like a core, that core can undergo convection, just like your lava lamp. Um, basically, it's an effective way for it to cool. And that churning of that uh, conducting liquid can generate currents, electrical currents, that gen generate magnetic fields and that process which we call the dynamo process is what generates the Earth's magnetic field. So here we have a rapidly cooling uh, metal sphere and it's very uh, likely to generate a magnetic field as shown here in purple. That, as that proceeds, the outside will continue to cool. You might have eruptions on the surface as a result of contraction, but the outside will cool and then that can acquire um, a, what we call a remnant magnetization. Its electrons can align in the presence of that background magnetic field. And importantly, even after that field is long gone, the, the imprinted uh, alignment of electrons, which is basically what makes a bar magnet that sticks to your refrigerator, it's the same process, can still generate what we call remnant magnetic field. Just like if you put um, shaved filings around a bar magnet, you see its, bar, its, its magnetic field lines. So here we have this fossil or echo of some ancient magnetic field generated in the body. And if we have a spacecraft, we can um, orbit the body and maybe even detect its uh, magnetic field. So I'm gonna give it a chance for that to... Oh, yeah, sorry, let me go back one. It's a little bit of a delay, apologies. Okay, anyway, there was a cool graphic there. I don't know if you guys saw it. Um, I'm in California, so. Uh, so so we, we can detect its magnetic field if we have a magnetometer, and indeed, we, we do have a magnetometer on the spacecraft here shown on the right. This is, on the left side, we have the spacecraft bus and a, and a two-meter boom on the, in the upper right with two magnetometer sensors. We also have an imager, and the imager um, will do lots of things, but among other things, it will look for evidence of metal uh, large regions of metal on the surface, which would also be consistent with the hypothesis that Psyche is a metallic body with a, a form from the core. If we see a remnant magnetic field, we'll also conclude that Psyche formed from a core. We also have a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. Again, many things, it'll do many things, but one thing it'll establish is whether there are large regions of iron nickel metal consistent with formation from a core. So those would all be Too different many. that those, 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 those uh, observations of, of uh, large regions of metal from what we would see if Psyche was a differentiated body, um, in that uh, sorry, an undifferentiated body that never underwent large-scale melting. In that case, we might expect a fine-scale mi mixture of metal and rock. We also carry this uh, deep space optical communication, which is a really cool um, technology demonstration that uh, will, uh, if it works, pave the way for um, data transfer communications, uplink, a downlink with uh, lasers, which is a much higher data volume than the typical radio waves that we use. So we also, uh, we're powered by um, solar panels and you can see it by solar power, you can see these very large solar panels on the right connected to the spacecraft bus, which basically dwarf the, everything else in the spacecraft. We're also using electric propulsion powered by that. 
Okay, so just to end here, um, the concept of our orbital operations is that we um, are launching uh, in uh, neck in August. In fact, we just shipped to the Cape last uh, last Friday, Cape Canaveral. Um, we uh, will do a Mars flyby, um, and in the process, on the way to Mars, we will um, be doing the DSOC uh, technology demonstration at Deep Space Optical Communications. Then we arrive at Psyche in 2026, and um, at that point, we will go into orbit and then slowly lower our orbit uh, down to less than one Psyche radii above the surface, so less than 100 kilometers above the surface. And that we have the, that we call orbit D. And then this, the, mission, the nominal mission ends in October 2027. Okay, so to conclude, here is Psyche just a few weeks ago at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's basically, like I said, ready to go. It's now sitting in Cape Canaveral, and our launch window opens August 1st. And um, I wanted to just thank you very much for uh, letting me tell you about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I didn't get the chance to check with you before if it's Weiss or Weiss. Uh, I, I say Weiss. My ancestor said Weiss, so either way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I have a Weimarana, which Americans like to call a Weimarana. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, questions? Quick one? A quick question. Hi, Ben. Good to hey. see you. Good so, to see you um, good luck for the launch. Uh, just a question, since this is a space resource uh, community. So what kind of rock or elements, minerals, do you expect in addition to metal, if, if there right. are? So, um, so the density are, you know, sort of one sigma uncertainty in the density is somewhere between 3,400 and 4,100 kilograms per cubic meter. So, right, so that's denser than essentially any earth rock. That would overlap the density of chondrites, meteorites from bodies that, that never melted. If you put together all the different constraints, and that, you know, one of the big questions we have is, in fact, Psyche a metal world or not? Or is it maybe just a, like a, a, a intimate mixture of rock and metal? That, um, and so if you put that all together, Psyche could be made of sort of three things. It could be made out of metal, it could be made out of rock, and it could be made out of void space, porosity. So basically, we think for a body of that size, it's hard to believe, based on what we know about asteroids, that the porosity, the void space, is more than 20% by volume. If we accept that, um, then we, we conclude, based on what we know now, that the body is somewhere between 30 and 60% metal. So that's something like, you know, several times what a typical planet is like the Earth. And I think the big question for space resource, uh, say space resources, is 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 that you know big huge you know regions of solid metal, with uh, isolated regions of rock, or is it like a you know a fine scale mixture like we might see in a meteorite that falls to Earth? And we won't know until we get there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you for your time as Thank well. You. And uh, just uh, to all of you who are online, I've been looking at the forum. You're really from all around the world. Welcome to you all. I've seen messages coming in anywhere from Brisbane to other parts of the world. So I don't even know what time of day it is in some parts of the world for where you are. But you're so welcome to be joining us here. As has been mentioned in the forum part of the InEvent app, that is not where you put your questions. You put your questions in the question part. And we are really trying to make time for questions. We now will return turn to Su Meng, who I think we have online from Origin Space. I'm not sure if that sound is a good sound or bad sound. <laughs> Su Meng, I can hear you. I see you, rather. I can't hear you yet. And I'm hoping that you will be able to talk to us about the progress of asteroid mining plans at okay. Origin. I can hear you, but there's a lot of interference behind you. I'm not quite sure. If you keep talking to us, I'm sure the tech team will either tell me it's, it's a yes or a no with hand waving or sound in my ear. So keep talking to us, Sue. OK, yes. Uh, sorry if uh, there was some uh, connection problems. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. OK, sounds great. Uh, now, yeah, there's my slide. Uh, so hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to participate this great uh, conference uh, this year. Uh, this is a third for uh, a workshop. And uh, uh, I'm happy to report that in the last year, we have made some 
uh, interesting progresses in our company. So first of all, let me uh, briefly introduce our inner space, see if it works. Oh, it works. It didn't work last year. Uh, so uh, our inner space was established in, uh, almost three years ago in 2019. Uh, so it's still the first and currently only commercial company in China dedicated to explore and to utilize space resources. Uh, so of course our company's long-term goal is to discover, explore, develop, and to utilize material resources such as metal and water from nearest asteroids to better serve the space uh, industry and the human uh, activities in space in the future. Uh, so uh, our company was founded by quite an international scientific team and the senior uh, aerospace engineering team. So we also re received uh, several tens of millions of US dollar funding uh, for two rounds and currently we're raising for the third round for, uh, from top investment institutions. Uh, we also have close collaboration with broad aerospace companies worldwide. Uh, I want to briefly mention why we call Orange Space as a, com a company's name. So we believe that asteroids uh, keep the most original information of our solar system. So they will not only tell the history, but also will lead the future of human beings. Uh, I think that's the philosophy behind uh, this view. Uh, so next slide. OK, um, so uh, we, uh, the, the, we, we're aiming for uh, asteroids uh, because possible, uh, it's possible to mine uh, under current legal frame, that's first of all. And also, uh, some near-Earth asteroids need less energy to go comparing to the moon. So we believe it's a first step in order to utilize space resources in situ. Uh, so our basis model is to you know, first of all, we need to find, characterize more near Earth asteroids. So we need space telescopes, multi wavelengths multi -wavelength space telescopes to find more mining targets. Uh, so uh, in this, um, uh, uh, under this um, uh, goal, we can also uh, collect and sell astronomical data and observation time uh, to start our business. So currently we can design, manufacture, test, uh, deliver in orbit, uh, the different uh, space telescopes, uh, and we also can uh, provide data calibration and the analysis services. Uh, so that's first uh, step. And simultaneously, we're also developing uh, uh, de developing te techniques necessary to uh, anchor asteroids when we have uh, future deep space missions. And we also hope to apply related technology to space industry market. For example, space de de uh, debris removal that could be a possible uh, market for, uh, for our um, future uh, business. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, we launched the first space telescope. We call it the Yangwang number one satellite. It's uh, in, in, in Chinese, it, uh, if you translate the name, it's basically looking up to the sky. So I think uh, it's a good name for a space telescope. And uh, we also launched uh, a small uh, satellite also last year, trying to, basically the idea is to release a mimic uh, uh, asteroids object. So we capture it with a net, so that the, the uh, mim mimic asteroid object uh, connected with a satellite, so we can uh, change the orbit and practice the future mining scenario. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so as you can see, uh, we successfully operated the first commercial space telescope. Uh, actually, we operated in both optical wavelengths and also UV wavelengths. Uh, uh, on the right hand side, you can see a very good looking picture. You can see the famous uh, Leonard Comet last year, uh, 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 picture together with uh, Aurora and uh, uh, background stars. So you can see this beautiful picture was taken by our uh, telescope. Uh, and uh, 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 under, the under the atmosphere, you can see a small but uh, a visible meteoroid. So I think it's the uh, uh, first time 
that there is a, a comet meteoroid at Aurora uh, uh, showed in, the, in, in one uh, single picture. Uh, so we also uh, uh, provide routinely uh, asteroid data to uh, international community. As you can see, uh, our telescope, uh, Yang Wang Number no. One, has been listed as a uh, 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 as, as a permanent space observatory, uh, for, uh, comparing to other uh, famous ones. So next slide. Okay, so you can see uh, with this telescope, uh, we can have a video right here. So basically the idea is that uh, we can use the telescope to observe um, astronomical data uh, while doing the full sky surveys currently, and also uh, you can use the satellite to looking downward. Uh, uh, so on the left hand side, it's supposed to be a, a short video to show you that we can, we're taking uh, night light uh, uh, pictures. Mm, okay, uh, never mind. So this is the first, we're finishing up almost the first full sky survey uh, with our uh, Yang Wang number one uh, as a commercial space telescope. Uh, so the field of view is about 80 square uh, degrees. So it takes uh, quite some time to finishing up the first uh, sky survey with both optical and UV uh, wavelengths. Uh, so we're uh, doing the uh, data analysis by ourselves and calibrating the data, uh, uh, making up the catalog, uh, which is, will be soon available to the community. And also uh, using the same telescope, of, of, co of course, with different observation mode, uh, you can see that this is a new uh, light night maps uh, where uh, this, uh, this is one example of the Great Bay uh, area. So we can see the Hong Kong Island uh, in the bottom. Uh, on the left hand side is a uh, commercial, uh, uh, it's a, uh, the, the famous VS satellite from NASA. Uh, the map is available every single day uh, of, the, uh, of the whole globe uh, uh, for the, for the uh, night light maps. And we are taking the same area, same time. Uh, as you can see, the pattern is very similar, but we uh, can provide higher spatial resolution. Uh, and even the bridge connecting between the uh, Macau Island and the Hong Kong Island on the left, uh, the lower left corner, you can see a, a bright line, which is a bridge connecting the two islands, which is not vis visible from the VS map, but could be visible from our map. And uh, 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 the, another satellite called NEO-01, uh, Near, uh, Near Earth Object, for short, uh, was launched last April, almost uh, almost a year ago. So we basically, as I briefly mentioned, we used the net to capture a mock asteroid, uh, 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 and later on, uh, uh, it was only a demonstration uh, satellite. So uh, next year, we hope to launch a second one, which will be more powerful for all the all, all functions. Uh, so we hope to uh, try to. Uh, uh, increase the, the capability uh, to mimic the uh, uh, to, to to take advantage of the near near um, uh, uh, to take advantage of the lower orbit uh, to pr pra practice the necessary te techniques for uh, mining near Earth asteroids. And uh, for future missions, uh, as we mentioned uh, last year, so we are looking forward for uh, deep space missions around 2024. Uh, so currently, uh, it's a uh, mapping uh, satellite uh, as a heritage of the Yang Wang Number One Telescope. Uh, so the purpose is to uh, observe and characterize the lunar impact flash uh, events. Uh, so the idea is to uh, take more uh, take close uh, close up uh, observation uh, for uh, meteoroids impact on the moon um, so that we can remotely detect uh, their impact flashes with multi-band observations. So uh, I, I, there has been many uh, similar proposals, but I think it's uh, necessary for commercial companies to uh, improve uh, related technology 
the, the reason why we, we, as a company, we study lunar impact uh, is that we hope to uh, scientifically understand the evolution of the top layer uh, of the lunar surface and also characterize material population uh, in the uh, Earth's lunar uh, space. Uh, I think it's quite crucial for future uh, development of related uh, many missions so we can provide related service uh, and the data uh, for uh, uh, different countries and uh, entities. We also hope to uh, quantify hazards in view of hum future human explorations. So there are many uh, related um, uh, uh, human exploration uh, uh, plans for the next five to 10 years. So I think it's important to characterize uh, the, uh, under the scenario of lunar impact uh, from small bodies. Uh, next slide. You have two minutes, man. Okay, yes. So we also hope to search for uh, small bodies further away. So uh, as we know, light from a distant star uh, could be uh, obscured uh, uh, during the chance passage of a small object in the outer solar system between a star and the uh, spacecraft. So we can use the photometry of the star uh, to review a characteristic reduction in, in flux uh, in order to actually see the invisible uh, small uh, bodies and characterize the whole population. So this has been an idea for quite a long time uh, and there has been some demo uh, ground-based uh, observations and I think it will be the first time we can use a space telescope uh, as a heritage from our Yangwang uh, uh, Yang uh, series of telescopes to observe uh, these um, uh, events. And uh, next slide. Uh, and we mentioned that last year also, as we are planning for a future a phase mission, potentially hazardous uh, asteroid CubeSat exploration mission. It is uh, still on the way, uh, and we are practicing our CubeSat uh, uh, engineering capabilities to uh, make sure it could be done with a CubeSat uh, uh, mission. It's very challenging, but we are, we are getting there. Uh, okay, so finishing up. Uh, we organized a space resources forum earlier this year. So you can check out uh, all the videos available on this website. So feel free to check it out. I think there uh, has been some quite interesting discussions during this forum. Okay. That's right. Uh, so uh, our uh, headquarters is in Nanjing. Uh, right next to Nanjing Observatory uh, and Nanjing University, which is the best university in terms of uh, astro astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, and our Beijing office is next to Peking and Tsinghua University, the best universities in China. So you are more than welcome to visit our headquarters and uh, 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 research center in Beijing. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad that we could get back to you over there. And it's a wonderful, kind invitation to everybody here present for a little trip to Beijing to, to look at your premises there. We do have a question. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Meng. It was, uh, it's always impressive to see all these uh, projects going on. So there is a question about the uh, captured asteroids. If you succeed to capture an asteroid, where will you park it? Uh, Lunar space. I think uh, the, the suggested orbit is around the moon. Around the moon, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and for all of the other questions that have been coming in, if you're keeping a note of them on track, um, well, we have our resident expert who's answering them. And indeed, I don't have to turn very far for our next speaker. Again, thank you very much, Meng Su, for your lovely talk. Uh, and we wish you all the best with that continued work. And uh, we're following on now. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I could just turn to my left, and there you are. Our next speaker is Patrick Michel, the Director of Research at CNRS for the Observatoire Côte d'Azur. You've been showing me lovely pictures from your observatory. It's a wonderful location to holiday or work, as he says he does. <laughs> it's over to you. Okay, thank you. So I'm very honored to be the first speaker in 3D in this session. 
and I'm going to present you the uh, HERA mission, which is under development at the European Space Agency, uh, to visit a binary asteroid called Didymos. And what I want to show you is uh, what are the lessons that we can learn that can be useful for uh, asteroid mining and resource purposes. I don't see the slides yet on screen. Yeah, okay, thank you. So this is on behalf of, of course, of the, of the HERA team. So first I want to say that asteroids are really fascinating because contrary to what we thought initially, they are not just space rocks, very uh, boring. Actually, they show an incredible diversity. Uh, all objects are very different, uh, uh, very different with each other, uh, different shapes, different masses, different sizes. And also on one asteroid, you have an amazing amount of different geological features, from landslides to boulders to craters. Even some bodies have some, some activity, they show ejection of particles. And we are still at the stage where we try to understand what it means. So we are in this era, we are discovering new territories, which are a few hundred million kilometers away from Earth. The information is not available with ground-based telescopes, so we need to keep visiting them in order to better understand this complexity in terms of geology. And this is very important for mining purposes because for, for now, we still have to uh, uh, interact scientists and companies that want to do mining because scientists get knowledge uh, to, to understand them, basically. And um, uh, even more importantly, uh, images don't tell everything because what we know now is that if you want to understand the mechanical properties and how the bodies respond to an external action like a mining tool, then you need to interact and you will see why later. So uh, HERA takes place in the framework of the IDA cooperation. So IDA stands for Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment. It's a scientific collaboration that supports the development and data interpretation of both DART by NASA and HERA. So DART was launched in November 23, a very beautiful launch in California with a SpaceX uh, launcher, and will perform an impact on September 26th this year on the small moon called Dimorphos of the binary asteroid Didymos. Uh, before doing the impact, it will release an Italian CubeSat called Licia Cube that will uh, observe the impact itself and the first minutes after the impact. And then later, HERA will come on the crime scene and will fully characterize the DART impact outcome as well as the binary system and the small moon in terms of physical and compositional characterization. Uh, it's too bad, the movie is not going. So the movie was going to show you how DART will impact the small moon and the ejecta that may be produced. But uh, more importantly, what we want to do with, with HERA is to measure in great detail the impact outcome in terms of the deflection, but also in terms of the crater size and morphology, and also in terms of the interior properties of the asteroids, both the subsurface in the crater and the interior itself. So the launch of HERA will take place on with an Ariane 6 launcher, and then we'll arrive uh, at the end of 2026 for uh, about, about six months of uh, characterization. So it's four years after the DART impact. But these don't, uh, um, don't uh, change much uh, uh, over four years. They change on astronomical... So what we want to... Okay. So this is like space missions, we need a redundancy and backups so that we have everything <laughs> working. So yes, so um, we arrive four years later, but we want to measure the crater size, the mass of the moon, and all the things that we want to measure won't change after four years, fortunately. So the, the, what, what's important to know is that uh, we are going to visit this system called Didymos, where the small moon Dimorphos is only 160 meters in size, and therefore this is about the same size as the largest rock on uh, Ryugu, which was visited by Habuza 2. But we don't know really what is a 160 meter size body in space. We don't know how it looks like, whether it is a monolith, whether it is an aggregate. We have absolutely no clue because we never saw such a rock free in space. So that will be very interesting also for mining purposes because of course the smaller bodies are much more abundant than the larger ones. And 160 meter size is quite interesting. Uh, also we'll do for the first time uh, uh, the interior measurement
measurements with a radar sounding. It has never been done before. All we know about the interior of asteroids come from the bulk density that we measure, and we compare with meteorite analogs, and then the difference tells us how much void there is inside. But we don't really know what it means, the void, whether it is microporosity, macroporosity, etc. So we want to know that. And then with uh, DART and HERA, we'll have a fully documented impact experiment at hypervelocity. And depending on what kind of interaction you want to do, you need to have this kind of experiment at the correct scale, which is asteroid scale, because so far all our understanding of impact physics rely on comparison with uh, impact experiment in the lab on centimeter sized targets. And we hope that the numerical models validated at this scale work at large scale. But as you will see just afterwards, it's not so clear. So the, the CubeSat uh, spacecraft of HERA is developed uh, by OHB and the uh, Industrial Consortium uh, around Europe. And then we have uh, cameras on board, as well as a LiDAR, and the thermal infrared imager, which is uh, developed by JAXA. So it's an international cooperation out of Europe, which is quite interesting. And then we have two CubeSats. I will tell you about them. And an inter-satellite link and radio science to complement and get a, a great measurement of gravitational field of the asteroid. So the first CubeSat is fully devoted to the geophysical properties of the asteroid. And this is where we'll have the first measurement of the internal properties through uh, the, the low frequency radar sounding. And that will allow us to measure the level of uh, internal heterogeneity. Are we dealing with a monolith? Are we dealing with an aggregate with large voids? Are we dealing with something which has uh, just a small void? This is very important if we want to understand the mechanical properties of these very small worlds in space. Then we have another CubeSat devoted to the mineralogy as well as dust detection. And with an asteroid spectral Im imager, we'll be able to measure the composition of the body, both within the crater, so basically the subsurface composition, and outside the crater, which has two uh, uh, um, interests. One is to verify whether the interior has the same composition as the outside, and also to measure how space weathering works, because the, the crater has been formed four years ago, so it's quite fresh. So we, re we revealed this material very uh, recently, and we can compare how the exposure to space uh, make a difference over time. So the spacecraft is actually uh, under development, so it's quite exciting to see the little baby uh, taking shape. And you can see uh, different hardware, like the eye gain antenna, the pressure tank. But the best is the backbone, which is now built. As you can see here, this uh, big tube that serves as a ba backbone to the spacecraft. It is under test. And you can see below the, the pink uh, aluminum cone, which serves to, uh, um, to uh, attach basically the launcher to, to the spacecraft, so it's really nice to see this coming along after so many years of uh, waiting and fights. Uh, the, so there are many firsts, uh, you don't see the movie, but uh, this is the first rendezvous with a binary asteroid, so there will be a NASA mission called Janus that will perform two flybys of binaries in 2026, but this is really the first rendezvous where we'll have a fully detailed characterization, um, and as I said already, the first deep, deep space CubeSats for very close proximity, internal properties, and also landing, because at the end we will land the CubeSats. And this is important because ERA will tell you about not only the composition and the structural properties of the body, but also how it responds to different kind of actions with dart impact and also with the bouncing of the spacecraft. And as I said, you need really to touch to know how it uh, behaves. And this is demonstrated by the Hayabusa 2 mission, which absolutely successfully made this crazy experiment, which was to launch a two kilogram projectile at two kilometers per second on the surface of Ryugu. And you can see the two images uh, on the left is before the impact, on the right is after. And contrary to what happens in the Hollywood movies, where the big guy, you know, he hit a big stomach, and then, ow, it hurt the feet, this is totally opposite. We hit it, and it behaved like a fluid. And that's why we have such a large crater of 17 meters. We were expecting two, three meters if the surface had cohesion. But in fact, it seems that the surface behaved like a cohesionless, like a fluid, basically, surface, which is a little uh, uh, surprising, because if you see on the left image, we see rocks, and rocks, for us, need to be solid to behave like rocks. Where in low gravity environment, now we understand that it's not necessarily true. Even a rock with a very tiny amount of cohesion can behave as a rock when there is no gravity to compensate. However, when you touch it, it goes down. And this is exactly what happened. We could not know that if we didn't touch, which is interesting. And with Hera, we'll know what happened on a 
even lower level of gravity and at a higher impact speed. So we can see how all these things scale with speed and, and size of the body. The other interesting experiment was the one done by Osiris Rex. So Osiris Rex is another sample return mission that successfully uh, sampled about, we estimate, 200 to 400 grams that are coming back to us in 2023. And here, oh no, unfortunately the movie doesn't work, but you could see the movie where basically the, the sampling head touched the surface, and again, although we see rocks on the surface, it went down with almost no resistance. So that's also surprising, and again, we see that these bodies have a counterintuitive behavior when you touch them. And finally, with the era, we'll go even lower in gravity. So we can really see how these processes scale with gravity. And that, of course, has a lot of implications for mining purposes. We need to understand how, depending on gravity, the material behaves. And unless we do these experiments, we cannot really know. And at the end, as I said, we will land the CubeSats, and they are equipped with accelerometers. We can measure bouncing properties. So we'll have different ways to understand the mechanical response of these bodies, whether you are interested in launching a probe at hypervelocity or uh, for just a bouncing experiment. So, and here again, there were some movies, sorry, but that was to show you that to accompany those efforts in space, we have a modeling tools that are developed with a motivation that we can now validate them at the correct scale, and we have a, a lot of tools that allow us to model the interaction of uh, uh, devices in the surface as a function of the properties that we give, assume properties, because so far we have been surprised with what we found on site, which show that we are still uh, far too understand these bodies, but we have to combine these modeling efforts with the actual space missions if we want to be prepared then to mine these bodies. Finally, we also have the European Commission, which is interested in this uh, uh, end behavior because uh, the European Commission funds a few consortium, including this one, uh, where uh, we are developing new models, new instrumentations, data analysis operations, all centered for the moment on HERA because this is the mission in development. But we are also uh, um, developing instruments that are not on board HERA to prepare the future and including uh, uh, mining uh, missions. So finally, I would say that uh, ERA is uh, really uh, interesting because it will provide us new knowledge on a different kind of body than the one that have been just explored by Hayabusa and Osiris Rex. There were dark type bodies which seem to behave like collisionless materials. Didymos is a bright type one, silicate one, and therefore we need to understand what happened in this case so that we cover all the range, uh, the parameter range. We also know now that we need to interact with these bodies to understand how they respond to an uh, interaction. And we also discovered the sensitivity to the cohesion. Uh, you know, one pascal is just the pressure of a leaf on my hand, and this makes a huge difference on an asteroid. So as I said, we still need to train, to touch, and to see how it works, so that we will be eventually prepared uh, for mining, and I'm very hopeful that this will happen soon, given all the projects that are going on in space on, on these pole bodies. And finally, I will just advertise, if you are interested in ERA, uh, uh, the workshop that takes place in Nice, where the weather, weather is nice, but in Luxembourg is very nice too, I discovered. <laughs> so, uh, and you are all welcome to also visit the, the website with uh, many, many news that can be also interesting for, for mining uh, community. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> so I don't see any question online. I don't know if you have uh, another... There are no questions online, but I have a little question for you, Patrick. Yes, the weather has been rather nice in Luxembourg. It's not a question about weather, don't worry. Uh, it's nicer in Nice. Um, no, it's just, uh, we were chatting and you mentioned you enjoyed the talk by uh, the new Director General of ESA, uh, Joseph Aschbacher, and uh, you were hoping that what he said is going to become reality because we were discussing the risk and the nature of risk when it comes to Europe versus America, for example. And you mentioned a couple of dates. You mentioned 2050 and 2030. So can you give us a, a little bit more on that? You mean about the, 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 the program and the year? Yeah, that's, that's one thing that is a, a little uh, problematic is that we, in Europe, we tend to be too long. And we have a, a, a long time process, especially in the science program, where basically we are asked to make proposals for missions that will take place, you know, sometime 20 years after. Uh, the Cosmic Vision program was uh, developed in, 24, in 2004, and there is only one mission that has been launched yet, which is Solar Orbiter. And I think this is, this is problematic because 
the community needs a, a turnover. Uh, it's more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, motivating when you know that you will see eventually your mission going instead of being retired and having uh, already forgotten what you wrote 50 years <laughs> before. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course. Uh, but I think it's very important that uh, what the, the, the DG of ESA said, that we need to, to go faster and also to, to accept risks. Because this is something that we need also for mining. We need to explore and to better understand those bodies so that you get prepared to take no risk because you understand what you have. But first, when you explore, you don't know what you're going to get. And therefore, you need to accept this level of risk that will allow you to, you know, to learn how to do. And, uh, and I, I hope this spirit will, uh, will um, come in Europe. It's already there, but uh, more in practice. Thank you so much again, Patrick. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions, but uh, we are already uh, racing through. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is also on site. It's uh, Mitch Hunter Scullion, who is the founder and CEO of Asteroid Mining Corporation UK. And uh, Mitch is going to talk about Asteroid Mining Corporation using space robotics to establish the new space resources economy. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to be here for, I think, the third time now. Um, it's great to see it growing every single year. So fantastic turnout as ever. I'm going to interrupt. You've got a lovely Scottish <laughs> accent. I do indeed. Take I. it very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as slow as I possibly can. Um, so I am here to talk to you about Asteroid Mining Corporation and what we are currently working on. Um, so just to do a bit of conceptualization before we go any further, um, there are a lot of very talented astronomers and astrophysicists in here who will already know this information, but there are over 1.5 million asteroids in the main belt of a one kilometre diameter. Um, they're up to date. We are now um, 28,000 near Earth asteroids have been counted, if our calculations are correct. But this is the interesting bit. What is one of those asteroids worth? So this is a, a benchmark. So these are essentially rough estimations. But a single one kilometre diameter, upper 90th percentile bountiful, Platinum-bearing metallic asteroid could contain metals worth 20 trillion pounds. Um, that's 10 times the gross domestic product of the United Kingdom. And also, just for reference, does not take account of price depreciation. Because obviously, if you bring that all back in one go, you're absolutely going to crater all the prices of these metals. Um, but I think it serves as a good starting point for having an understanding of just potentially how lucrative space resources could be in, in the fullness of time. So how do we go about extracting that economic value? So Asteroid Mining Corporation, we have taken a grounded view, as we like to call it, which is predominantly focused, at least initially, on terrestrial robotics. So the space-capable asteroid robotic explorer platform is a, a multi-use robotics platform. Um, it offers unique terrestrial capabilities. And when I say unique, it is a spider. So as we all know, spiders can climb walls and climb ceilings. And so too shall scary. Um, but ultimately, we are a space resources business. So this technology is designed for asteroid mining. Clues probably in the name somewhere. Um, so with the space-capable asteroid robotic explorer platform, we are using this as a, ultimately a platform for revenue generation because I think one of the, the main areas of development for the space resources industry going forward is to generate significant revenues and profits in order to support the long-term science and engineering required to make this industry a success. But once we are kind of past that point, we need to move into the prospecting. Asteroid mining follows terrestrial mining and that it follows the traditional mining industry. Prospect, explore, extract. So phase two, as we move into 2024 and beyond, is the prospecting and the asteroid prospecting satellite one, or asteroid prospecting satellite series, um, which will estimate the composition of near Earth asteroids and main belt asteroids. And then towards the end of this decade or the start of the next decade, we will be looking to send one of the space capable asteroid robotic explorers or several of them to an asteroid which has been identified as being potentially valuable, at which point we would then look to ground proof some of the resources and the technology. So that's quite far into the future. Let's focus on the here and now. So allow me to introduce you to the space capable asteroid robotic explorers. 
um, or as we like to use our, our snappy tagline, last kilometre logistics in space. Because there is a challenge at the moment, and I'm sure as you've kind of noticed, particularly for asteroid exploration, um, targeted locomotion is very difficult in that in order to be able to go and you know, look over that brow, see what's down that kind of cliff face, you are quite limited in capabilities at this particular moment in time. So SCARE is designed to allow for targeted exploration on small planetary bodies. Um, so we're very fortunate to have partners at the Space Robotics Lab at Tohoku University. Um, so Professor Mikio Laney and Professor Kazuo Yoshida are our two main partners on this. And um, we are working with the uh, Space Robotics Lab for the next two years um, in order to get the SCARI prototype to maturity. So what does SCARI look like? What does it do? It's a biomimetic design. It's inspired by insects, predominantly arachnids, but also reptiles. Um, so one of the, the main innovations is in the, the adhesion to the surface, because in order to ensure that you can move on a surface, you need to be able to ensure that you have grip, which requires multiple points of contact and requires ultimately the capability to continue to be holding and moving and holding and moving. Um, so spiders are perfect, dogs less so. Um, also, a modular swappable payload allows for versatile mission profiles. Um, it's symmetrical and fully reversible architecture for omnidirectional mobility. So, you know, you can go in just about any direction you can imagine. The platform is scalable, so the initial models will be 20 kilograms. However, we can scale that up to 200 kilograms um, over the next few years. Um, it is underwater, at microgravity and vacuum capable. Um, and also, obviously, for the space the domain, radiation hardened and toxin proof. Um, but with a suite of proprietary electronics as well. So extreme terrain mobility is really the, at the core of what we're doing at Asteroid Mining Corporation. These are somewhat limited in what I can show you at the moment, but these are kind of the, the grippers which we're, we're working on. I actually have one in London, but I'm not, apparently not allowed to show it to you at the moment. So sadly, you'll just have to deal with these. But ultimately, the extremely une uneven terrain is impossible to navigate with wheeled robotics. Wheels do not work on asteroids or in microgravity. But a light climbing platform can potentially travel anywhere with a solid interface, including vertical and inverted surfaces. So grippers can lock the robot to the ground and offer tactile feedback as well, which is particularly interesting for some scientific purposes. On the visual navigation side, obviously on asteroids, you cannot rely on GPS because it doesn't exist. So robot localization is obtained solely from information provided by the cameras and depth sensing equipment within the robot itself. But the data compiled over time builds a map of the region around the landing site. So you can, over the course of time and through multiple explorations, track changes to the environment as well. So SCARE is designed to be swarm compatible. So swarm intelligence is collective behavior of decentralized and self-organized systems. Um, fully decentralized robots ultimately means autonomous activities and potentially infinitely scalable systems as well. Um, SCARI is designed with multiple operation modes, fully autonomous, which is the default for asteroid purposes, where robots decide for themselves how to achieve their mission goals. Semi-autonomous, where the operator requests an outcome and defines constraints, and then remote controlled, where you'd have an astronaut or an operator controlling it. Um, although for asteroids, the time delay makes that somewhat less useful. But the application of SCARI, I think, is quite myriad here because ultimately it's a, a low cost and high impact solution to advance the exploration of the solar system. Um, it's designed for asteroid exploration, but also has terrestrial use cases. It's gravity agnostic, and it means that therefore it's a versatile platform for exploration missions to lunar and Martian destinations as well. Um, ultimately, we are payload agnostic, so our, our intention here is to ultimately have a platform for instruments to be hosted. Um, if it fits within our form factor, then we'd be interested in speaking to you. Um, we do have quite a, an open sort of opportunity at the moment for collaborations. Um, but ultimately, once you've landed uh, a spacecraft and you want to do targeted exploration, then SCARI should be the, uh, the key to unlocking that, that last kilometer of exploration throughout the solar system. And um, I would just like to leave you very quickly with a, a nice image that we like to see of what we, what we think the future is going to look like. So um, thank you very much.
Thank you so Thank much, you. Mitch. So I think we have one question. Uh, so which specific mining technology are you targeting at IMC to actually extract the PGM? Um, so we are predominantly looking at um, drilling technologies, so core internalized augers. Um, sorry. Um, so core internalized augers for the most part because um, obviously it's quite a, it's a challenging environment to, to operate in. Um, but essentially we'd be looking at what we like to call the fangs on the spider. <laughs> so, um, to um, omnidirectional drills coming out as essentially extra legs. Okay, and uh, yeah, I have another question. Based on what Patrick said before, like uh, the cohesion of the asteroid might be extremely, extremely low. Uh, did you think about that when you want to land your spider on, a, on an asteroid? And it's something you... Um, I mean, it's, it's the end goal. Um, there's a, a work up in capabilities to be done. So whether or not that is low Earth orbit the moon, and then asteroids. Um, ultimately, asteroids are, are the end goal here, but there is a, a, a demonstration of capability that has to be done in the meantime, and also the, the, the up-close analysis of the, um, the physical properties of the asteroid itself are very important. So it's all, it's all part of a broader picture. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again, Mitch, and it was lovely to hear that Scottish accent. I hope everybody enjoyed that. It's, it's so musical. <laughs> Next, we have Slava Trushev and Pete Vorden on site, I believe, if they'd like to come to the stage. Perhaps it's just uh, Pete, perhaps. Just Pete. Okay, uh, welcome, Pete. Uh, JPL Breakthrough Initiatives, and the talk is entitled Emerging Solar Sailing Capabilities for Solar System Research, Exploration, and Resource Utilization. It, it's so nice to see people in person, but you know, used to Zoom, I have to make sure I brought my pants today too. So <laughs> anyhow, it's, 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 it's good to be here. I think I did. Uh, <laughs> what I'd like to talk uh, about today is a, uh, is a application of some work that the foundation is doing as, as well as some work going on at JPL that we think is very applicable to asteroid research. Uh, I wanna note that <clears throat> the Breakthrough Initiatives is is actually a Luxembourg Foundation as well as a U.S. Foundation. We have joint offices in, in uh, here in Luxembourg and, and also in Silicon Valley. Uh, just to, by background, the, the, the Breakthrough Initiatives is a several hundred million dollar effort uh, to look uh, at the big questions of life, which I'm not really going to go over. Uh, the, uh, but the third one uh, is, is relevant to this, uh, is uh, can we travel between the stars? Uh, we have a number of, of initiatives that we can talk about uh, other times. One of them is to look for intelligent signals. Uh, we don't go anywhere in national capitals. That's a bad place to find intelligent signals. Uh, but uh, we have another one to look for life-bearing planets uh, uh, around the nearby stars. Uh, but the one that's most relevant is Breakthrough Starshot. This is a $100 million 10-year effort to develop the means to actually send a probe at 20% the speed of light to the nearest star systems uh, using a, a laser-driven light sail. Uh, but the interesting thing about light sails, uh, and this is an artist's conception of them flying by a planet in probably the Proxima Centauri system, uh, is that they have some near-term applications. And I want to talk a little bit about those. Uh, this is a program that uh, Slava Turechev, who will be here in a few weeks, uh, uh, did under NASA uh, funding. And uh, their interest was, uh, of course, we were trying to go to nearby star systems. Their point was, well, maybe we could just image them. And of course, if you do, a, do the sums, you find out that imaging a planet around even the nearest star systems that you could see anything requires a, 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 a telescope that's about a million kilometers. It turns out we have such a telescope. It's called the sun. Uh, the sun is an intense gravitational field. It actually bends starlight much like a lens does. And so Slava and his teammates under, under, uh, under NASA sponsorship and JPL sponsorship showed that, that uh, if you could get to the focal point, uh, which is actually a line focus, uh, you could use the sun to image uh, a, uh, a planet orbiting a nearby star. Now, this is good news. The bad news is this point is 500 to 800 astronomical units out and reminding everybody that the farthest we've gotten to date is about 130 astronomical units. Uh, so their point was, we need to go a lot faster. 
And what you'd like to do is travel between 30 and 50 astronomical units a year. Uh, and they concluded there's a way to do that using the technology we're developing for laser-driven light sails. Uh, and this is basically uh, that you use light pressure. Uh, if you take a, a, a thin material, a sail in space, uh, sunlight is reflected in whatever angle you can end up getting a, a thrust and a pretty substantial one. Uh, the problem is, of course, near the, near the Earth, the uh, light sails will work, it's just they don't, uh, they're not terribly efficient. However, uh, and, and they've developed a number of, of, of ideas, but if you can go closer to the sun, and they, these are called sun divers, uh, you can get much, much higher speeds. Uh, so the studies that uh, JPL did under NASA sponsorship uh, said that we could probably, with properly developed uh, light sails in going really close to the sun, it's a, you know, a few solar radii, uh, sort of where the inside where the Parker solar probe is gone, we could end up getting 30 to 50 uh, astronomical units a year, and you could send something that would take maybe, you know, 10, 15 years to get out to the solar gravitational lens point. Uh, since then, the uh, JPL, in concert with, uh, with the Breakthrough Initiatives, has looked at, can we do a, a, a uh, maybe a less dramatic thing, uh, a little bit uh, simpler, with very small spacecraft? Uh, and I just want to point out that light sails are now becoming a big deal. Uh, that uh, and we have interplanetary CubeSats that don't weigh very much. Uh, there's been a couple light sails flown, uh, several by the Planetary Society, privately funded, uh, and one uh, by Icarus, uh, a JAXA mission a few years ago. Uh, and indeed, you could even include a, a very small nuclear power source in these. So given these technologies, over the last few years, we've started to look at what could we do. and. Uh, uh, so there was a, a demonstration mission that has been developed that, uh, that, that JPL and our foundation believes would cost a few tens of millions, and it's sort of a few tens of kilograms that could actually be launched as a secondary payload uh, on uh, uh, any mission that has sort of close to a, a C3 of zero, so anything going to the moon or into the solar system could launch these as secondary payloads. Uh, and that uh, they don't have to go that close to the sun to get pretty significant speeds. In fact, we think that if they go about two-tenths of an astronomical unit, which is about uh, uh, halfway between the, the sun and Mercury, the planet Mercury, uh, that we could end up getting five to 10 astronomical units a year of speed with a small satellite, uh, which is pretty substantial. That gets us to the outer solar system and in, you know, to Jupiter in six months, uh, to a year, to Saturn in a year or two, and even to Uranus and Neptune. Uh, and there, and uh, there's, a, there's a program plan being put together uh, uh, that has everything except the money right now, uh, which is why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, we, we are, uh, we do have uh, our foundation, NASA, and a few others are interested in this. Uh, but the idea is you take this device, you launch it, somewhere near in, in cislunar space, you unfurl the sails and they catch the sunlight and they slow the spacecraft down so it drops towards the sun. This may take uh, a number of months, but then when it gets, uh, uh, it spirals into about two tenths of an astronomical unit, you change the orientation of the sails and pick up substantial uh, solar pressure and accelerate to, uh, to five to 10 astronomical units a year uh, and then uh, then uh, do your, your mission in the outer solar system, which could clearly include missions to various asteroids and in, in, uh, in, in flybys to find information about. Now, these, have, uh, these are real. Uh, the, some of these models have already been constructed under NASA sponsorship, uh, and uh, uh, we think that they're, they're pretty easy to do. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, that that uh, you get these rather modest speeds. Uh, we've, we've had a number of workshops, and I'll talk about those. The next one, by the way, is gonna be in Luxembourg in a few weeks. Uh, but we think that uh, these have a significant potential for space resources as well as space science uh, throughout the solar system because it opens up the entire solar system to rather low-cost missions. 
as I mentioned, uh, we, we had our first workshop uh, a few weeks ago in, uh, at Cornell Tech in New York City. Uh, the next one is, is here in a few weeks, uh, at, uh, working with the University of Luxembourg. Uh, anyone that is interested in attending uh, this workshop here, let us know. We have some spaces available. Uh, we will then have another conference uh, in association with the Breakthrough Initiatives uh, Annual Discuss Conference. Uh, and then a few more uh, discussions both here in Europe and uh, in the United States. Uh, but we think this is a, a, a pretty exciting uh, uh, possibility and uh, we can do, potentially access a lot of objects that in the past, particularly ones that might have a, a, uh, an orbit that makes them very diff difficult to access with uh, with conventional uh, technology that's, that's affordable. Uh, I'll stop there and I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions, but uh, do uh, contact me or uh, we have a couple other of our Breakthrough Initiatives folks. Uh, there's James uh, Skulkvik who's waving his hands and there's Kieran Groton who's also waving his hands back there. Uh, they know a lot more about this than I do and they can put you on the, uh, Slava Turechev will be at that, that meeting as well as some other experts on, on sun divers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question. Okay. We have a couple of questions. They're just yes, deciding between are, themselves who's yeah, going to go Yeah, it's very first. interesting. So we are fighting <laughs> to ask questions. Uh, I think there is one which is online, which I also have. So I have two qu quick questions. First, how do you solve the heat problem when it comes close to the sun? Because it comes super close. Well, uh, it, at two tenths of an AU, it's 25 suns. Uh, that's not. I mean, it's not trivial, but it's <laughs> it's a. Uh, you only really take that much heat for a day or two. You know, so you're not that close very well. It's for a day or two, okay. And that's where the maximum uh, is. And, and we think that, uh, you know, pretty standard reflectivity and, and uh, you know, thermal uh, control systems will, will make that work. And we've begun to do some design work on it. It doesn't appear to be a difficult problem. Now, if you're going in to, to get much higher velocities, now that's uh, uh, slightly tougher. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I do mention that the Parker Solar Probe, uh, you know, developed technology, but that's a much heavier system. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking at things that can be done with sort of small sat, you know, CubeSat kind mm -hmm. of constructs that, that we think can be done. Okay. And the last question is also online and I had the same. How do you slow down your, your, your solar sail uh, if you want to make a rendezvous? You don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, I should say that, that, that depending on where the target is, if, if the target's in the inner solar system, you know, you could potentially use sunlight to s slow down or potentially orbit mm -hmm. Jupiter or uh, Mars, again, at the, at the cost of a longer mission. Uh, but uh, most of these things are flybys, uh, mm -hmm. which are, you know, in terms of a, of a reconnaissance, that should be quite adequate. Now, there are ideas that we've looked at in our conference of impactors, you know, small impactors that uh, there's significant technology for, for small impactors that, uh, that has been developed. Uh, frankly, for military operations. Uh, it's, it's being tested currently in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, uh, these, these sort of small impactors could actually be done quite, to quite well in, in, uh, in, in terms of impacting an asteroid and getting mm. a significant results. Okay, thank you. Anything further? No, thank you thank so you. much. I worry about everybody walking down that stairs because I once saw somebody fall right off it, and uh, it was, and that was a, a main keynote. <laughs> that was a main <laughs> keynote speaker before anything had started. So every time I look over there, I, I slightly have goosebumps. Anyway, moving on to our next talk, which is online, so I don't have to worry about the steps. Please welcome David Heather from the European Space Agency, who's going to talk to us about Prospect. Welcome, David. Are you there? I am here. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you and I can see your slides. Great. I cannot see the slides at the moment. We're going to start with your lovely face, then we'll move to your <laughs> slides. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for that. I apologize for the first few seconds. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation for talking, first of all. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and present for the uh, second year in a row on the, on the prospect payload. So today I'll give you a quick overview of uh, what we're doing basically with Prospect, the status in terms of development and some of the uh, science activities that we've undertaken in the last year or two. 
So the uh, next slide, please. I think you might be able to move, oh, okay. Uh, okay, great, thanks. So for those who don't know, uh, Prospect is uh, quite complicated and a large payload. Uh, we have two main <clears throat> elements of Prospect. One is a drill assembly, which is called Proceed. Uh, and the second is an analytical laboratory, which is called Prosper. Um, basically what we're aiming to do with Prospect is to land in the south polar region of the moon, uh, to drill down to depths of up to one meter, uh, to sample the lunar regolith, um, and then we will deposit those samples into a series of ovens, uh, heat them up um, and release some gases, and then we will analyze those gases using some spectrometers. So we have an uh, ion trap mass spectrometer and a magnetic sector uh, mass spectrometer as well um, within the payload. So by doing this, we should be able not just to see whether there are volatiles, but to do some characterization of the volatiles as well and to learn a little bit about their origins. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail on all of that in a minute. Um, the original development for Prospect was, of course, for flight on board the Russian mission, uh, Luna 27, the Lunar Resource Mission. Uh, very recently, so since uh, all of the uh, since we uh, started preparations for this meeting, uh, the ESA Council decision on the 13th of April uh, was that uh, we will now discontinue all cooperations with Russia on the lunar missions. So, uh, in response to this, uh, the situation in the Ukraine, it means that uh, we will not be flying Prospect on the Luna 27 mission anymore. However, we were very fortunate that uh, we already have the basis for uh, another flight of Prospect on a NASA commercial lunar payload services mission. Uh, so the 10th uh, Eclipse mission, which is in the 2025-2026 timeframe, which is similar to the original schedule for, for Luna 27. So uh, in the last couple of weeks and from now on, we are working very hard to try to redirect all of our activities uh, towards uh, development for the NASA CLIPS mission. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are now an agreed core manifested payload on the 10th uh, CLIPS mission with NASA. And this will focus on uh, lunar resources and biology uh, with the objective to land at the South Polar region in the 2025-26 timeframe. We don't yet know what the additional payload on the mission is going to be, and we also don't know yet uh, which commercial lander provider we will be flying with. Um, what we do know is that we will not have nighttime survival, which we did have originally uh, for the uh, Luna 27 mission. So this is going to basically limit the number of vertical surveys, the drills, uh, drilling uh, episodes that we can do with the mission, uh, which will of course have a knock-on effect to the overall science that we can that we can do. And this is currently being assessed um, in terms of uh, the, the big impact on science. The most important thing to note though, is that all of the primary objectives that were listed on the previous slide, and you can see are listed on here as well, they are still valid, even with the shorter mission. So we will try to do as much as we possibly can in any case within the first lunar day. Development for Luna 27 was already in phase in CD, and it's also important to note that uh, because the payloads are pretty much identical, uh, the progress that we had made there will not be lost. So the critical design review stages that we were starting with uh, the primary elements uh, will continue this year for the, for the major units and the major components. Next slide, please. So a little bit more detail on the, the two major elements. So the prospect drill itself, as I mentioned, um, will drill down to about one meter depth below the, the lunar regolith. Um, we are actually capable of acquiring two samples, one fairly large sample and one much smaller sample. Um, and the smaller sample is the one that will be passed on to PROSPER. Uh, this was in the original design where we would pass the larger sample onto Russian instrumentation. It's not yet clear if we will need uh, the larger sample on the, on the NASA CLIPS mission, that's to be decided. But we are not aiming to change the design of the, the sampling system at the moment. Uh, that would cost us too much. Uh, the design, of course, uh, is there to minimize temperature increases during the sampling to make sure that we can preserve the volatiles uh, during the whole sampling sequence. Uh, and we also include uh, an imaging system, a subsurface permittivity sensor, and various temperature sensors along, along the drill as well, so we can look at the, uh, the environment as we drill. The laboratory itself, I already mentioned, um, it has a number of ovens. Uh, we will also have an imager on the laboratory to, to look at the sample before it gets sealed within the ovens. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, we have two different spectrometer systems within this analytical laboratory. So uh, uh, we can do stepped heating or ramped heating. And most importantly for this conference, we also have the possibility to, to heat up to high temperatures and uh, do some ISIU demonstrations. So we'll be aiming to try to extract oxygen from uh, some lunar minerals. Uh, next slide, please. So one slide quickly on the development status uh, for the drill. Uh, in, back in 2019 already, we had some successful demonstration of the capabilities of the drill design. Um, and uh, you can see some of the images there on the right hand side where uh, that's actually the, the Russian sampling tool, so the larger sampling tool that you can see there. On the bottom, on the right hand side, you can see uh, sticking out from the, the very end of the drill is the very small Prosper push tube. So that's the sampling tube that we will use uh, to feed into our uh, European um, analytical laboratory. And on the bottom left hand side, you can actually see the, the Prosper laboratory and some of the, uh, the hardware that we have already developed and is under testing within the, within the labs in Open University. Uh, all of the key elements for that laboratory, so the, the GPS, the ITMS and the uh, MSS, and this solid inlet system, which is the system that we will use to transfer the sample into uh, the laboratory. They have all been prototyped and they're being tested individually at the moment in, in, the, in the labs. So the next slide, please. Thank you. A couple of slides now on some selected science activities uh, that we've undertaken in the last couple of years. Um, one of the most important things that we have been doing and will need to continue doing quite actively this year is prioritization of the scientific operations. Uh, this is even more important now because we will have a much shorter mission because we will not have a nighttime survival. We will have one lunar days of, uh, of uh, science activity, so approximately 10 days, let's say, of operations. Um, so it's very important that we, uh, we try to maximize the uh, completion of all of our science objectives as quickly as possible. Uh, why should we minimize the resources that are needed to do this? Also in the last year, we've worked quite hard on improving the thermal modeling uh, throughout the entire uh, drilling and sampling chain. Um, and probably the most important output from this is the demonstration that uh, the volatile loss that we will experience is highest during the sample retrieval. And you can see the image on the left-hand side there, the, the Prosper push tube, uh, as it is uh, extended into the surface. You can see that uh, there's lots of reds and yellows there, and there's a lot of heating from that. So uh, at the moment, we're looking at uh, analyzing that in a little bit more detail, uh, trying to understand the, the impacts of uh, frictional heating uh, during that phase as well to try to minimize it. Um, we can tolerate up to 35% of volatile loss, around 35% of volatile loss before we start to lose scientific objectives. Um, and we've been looking at that entire process um, quite carefully to make sure that we can stay within that threshold. Um, and things are looking quite good at the moment. Alongside that, we've been assessing the magnitude and impact of uh, all of the potential contamination that we might experience, um, which are relevant to the elemental and isotopic uh, measurements. So we've uh, got an output from that, which is a contamination framework spreadsheet, and that's currently being ass assessed internally. But the overall message is that the science performance currently looks good with uh, what we understand to be our current plan for contamination control. So the next slide, please. Something I briefly re reported on last year as well um, is that we had a demonstration using the uh, breadboard of the Prosper Analytical Laboratory uh, that we can actually uh, do hydrogen reduction um, we successfully demonstrated that on the Prosper breadboard. Um, at the same time, uh, we also looked at the uh, ISIU studies uh, and it became very clear that ilmenite uh, is going to be uh, a very a key marker for us basically when we're doing the ISIU studies because it's, it's clear that there is a, a very strong correspondence between the amount of ilmenite in, uh, in the minerals and the, uh, uh, the resulting oxygen yield. Last year as well, we uh, did some work on the imaging systems. Um, so we had the engineering model of the imaging system uh, within uh, STEC and within the science team. Um, we did some testing on that uh, and everything went very well. At the moment, we are running through an exercise of uh, looking at those images within the science team and trying to analyze them to uh, see what we can understand from the images and the data alone uh, to see if we can actually characterize the mineralogy of the, of the samples that we looked at. And next slide, please. 
Uh, probably the most uh, important thing that we're doing as well at the moment in the next couple of months will be a continuation of the characterization from the landing site. Um, because we have a shorter mission, um, we need to try to maximize the chances of us uh, finding volatiles at the landing site. Uh, so the work that we have done up until now has been uh, characterizing the eight candidate landing sites that we had for Luna 27. We're now expanding that uh, to more regional studies so that we can uh, prepare for the landing site selection of the uh, CLIPS opportunity that we expect towards the end of this year. It's of course very important that we have an understanding of the subsurface thermal conditions uh, that will permit for volatile stability. Um, and we are targeting the locations that uh, will allow for that, but also give us the correct operational and engineering constraints, so power and communications, et cetera. So this work is ongoing um, alongside uh, studies that are underway to look at the thermal and radiative environment, uh, especially around the South Polar region where we have uh, a very complex, uh, complex environment. So the last slide, please. Yep, we have a couple of other prospect related opportunities for flight that I'd just like to, to let you know about. Uh, we have uh, an exospheric mass spectrometer, which is a small part of the overall prospect payload. Um, and uh, we have this ready for flight actually on the very first uh, NASA CLIPS mission, which, should, uh, which is scheduled for launch towards the end of this year. Uh, so that's on the PITMS uh, instrument. Um, and we also have a, a very similar uh, instrument, which will do some measurements of the exosphere uh, planned for the LOOPEX mission, which was presented a little bit earlier, and that will be in the 2025 and 2026 timeframe. And with that, I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. We have one question from Alexandre. Yes, thank you, David. I don't see a question online, but maybe I have one. So since you prospect won't fly with Luna 27, do, do you have spare hardware that could fly on another mission? That's, uh, I, I wish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, well, the plan was that we would, of course, have uh, development of both, uh, of, of uh, prospect for Luna 27 and for NASA CLIPS. Uh, the development had not yet started for the NASA CLIPS opportunity, so we do not currently have two sets of hardware prepared. So the short answer is no, uh, but we would potentially have funding for another opportunity uh, should something come up where we could uh, develop something for, for another mission uh, with another partner, then uh, we could potentially do that within that framework, but we don't have the hardware ready at the moment. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions, so... Thank you so thank much, you. David. Thank you. And we're sticking Thanks. with... Um, yep, thank you. <laughs> and we're sticking with the European Space Agency for our next two on-site speakers, as I believe. I hope they're here. I've got David Bins and John Rublevskis. I may have mispronounced that name. Oh, is it two people or one person? I'm not quite sure. Two. So we have David and John from... Issa, who are going John, to talk can, about... can you come on stage? What was that, ah, it's, it's, No, uh, it's not John. I think it's uh, someone on behalf of John. Oh, Harter. Harter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I don't have the correct name, but uh, <laughs> if you could introduce yourself to our audience, that would be wonderful. From yes. Issa. Yes, sure. I mean, um, good, after, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm David Benz. I'm from... ESA, and I work in the Systems and Concurrent Engineering Division in ESA, so our main role is to develop and assess missions, spacecraft, and in this case, uh, a payload. So the presentation is in two parts. So from the ESA side, we want to introduce somehow the Israel Demonstration Mission Oxygen Extraction on the Moon um, objectives from our perspective, and then we wish to pass it over to our colleagues from industry. I'm just going to be, uh, sorry, housekeeper again. The tech team are going to tell me off if I don't ask you to speak directly into the microphone. Oh, I'm not close for enough. Our on, for our online okay. audience, that red light, because uh, they want to hear you too, and we have lots of people online. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no problem, not close enough. Um, okay, so I'll go into the, the first slide just to introduce the, the mission and what we what we think at ESA would be a good and a, a valuable, valuable um, Israel demonstration um, of oxygen extraction. So, I mean, it's been something that's been done for, historically, for, for, for centuries, where you explore a new place and you try and utilize the, the resources of where you are. And it's no different when you go into space, but obviously, in space, it's 
obviously technically much more much more um, complex and, uh, and and challenging at least with respect to doing on the tap at home or taking the bucket to a to a river source or a water source um, cent centuries ago. So we wanted to scope our demonstrator around a, a few sort of important things to prove capability before of future investment. So this the idea of the demonstration here is to prepare programs to do such things as pilot plans and make a, an implementation scenario, an operational scenario in the future. But without this proof of concept in the dusty, cold, hot, cold, and very different thermal environment and massive temperature differences over different time periods, something we're not even used to, um, it's important to, to look into these things. So we want to in, in, understand the material of which we use. So to characterize it in advance, then we want to, and to, and to handle it so and produce a degree of oxygen. So the, the key markers are to handle the sample and measure the out, output reduction process. And these are the things that we figure are the key parts of a proof of capability. So in our assessment studies and the challenges for assessment is basically, I mean, we don't take the landing for granted. That's the first point. The, the, the landing interface to the lander is a tricky thing because the lander and the landing and the configuration mission is an open point now in the new lunar economy. So we search for a flight, we search for the best opportunity with which to accommodate our payload. And it is an open point and it is a reality of the assessment we have been working on at ESA. Um, we want to look at how we would excavate our sample and reliably move our sample into the, uh, the, the, the instrument or device. And then I focus back again on the loading and unloading. So it's important that we load, then we unload, and then we repeat. So we can see the degradation of the performance of the process as we go. So it's an engineering model in its, in its the perfect qualification environment. And um, then we measure what happens. So we can use this data to inform ground-based demonstrators, those, those other parts which space flight is not, ne not necessarily necessary for. Uh, and at the bottom right-hand side of the, the slide, um, it shows some of the constraints that we face, some of the constraints we set, so the dust environment, the temperature, the conditions, and the, uh, the power and the 10-day operations. And my colleague, David Heather, has emphasized the shortness of the operational time, and we don't assume a night survival here. It'd be, there. It'd be great if it was there, but yeah. So, go to the next point. So I could make some more maybe pragmatic, give an indication of the schedule. So. We've just finished what we call a preparation phase. So we've analyzed the, the trades, the processes, all the many different options. And I would not put the trade tree on the slide. The trade tree is very, very huge. And we've looked all through the different options. Um, and now we move forward into what we call a V1, so a preliminary, a preliminary phase. And then to do this, we adopted a challenge approach and we selected a winner recently. So and after this challenge phase, we want to obviously focus on, on having a flight opportunity. And, the, the, challenge, the phase B1 is in two parts. One is a system study which supports the preparation of the Ministerial Council coming up this year from a programmatic and a uh, planning perspective. And also we want to attach to our system study a number of technology demonstrations or breadboards which are directly linked to the system, the, uh, the system activity. So we focus on the technologies which are very, very specific to our payload. So we did it in a challenge format, so we have four candidates. At this point, I wanted to emphasize and thank everyone who involved and made bids, because what we found with a lot of our, our proposals that we've received at ESA is we found excellent quality, and it's very, very difficult to separate the best. So I want to obviously give my thanks to those that have made huge efforts to, to, to contribute to previous phases and also to contribute to the current phase and also make the effort to bid for the challenge, and I'm sure a lot of self-resources were, were used with what, what the kind of material we received. So many thanks for that. So we use a sort of requirements-driven approach. So we weren't specifying a process. I think I mentioned this uh, maybe a year ago in the previous workshop where we, we looked where we wanted to evaluate the compliance, the level of compliance to our requirements, how the, the payload concept has all the mission constraints that we provided. And as they were vague, but that was the nature of the landscape that we've, we, faced our, we faced with our flight opportunity not being defined at the current time. So we have many options, and we need to work through these in the coming, the coming months. Uh, and also we're very interested in proof of the process via testing and also a demonstration of the capabilities of the companies to do tests going forward. So we put a real practical testing element into our evaluation. And in the end, 
we came to a winner of, um, at the end of last year, and I can congratulate the winner. And I, I pass um, over to, to Artur from the Industrial Con Con Consortium to introduce themselves uh, and um, look a bit, explain a bit more deeply on the technical side and the engineering. So I'll give it to you, Artur. All right, thank you, David, uh, for the introduction. Thank you also to the organization for letting us, uh, you know, giving us the opportunity to co-present uh, with ESA. Right, so I'll go just straight to the next slide. So it's pretty much the obvious, um, extracting oxygen on the moon is a big thing. Um, also, you know, resources extraction in general, uh, as we'll see a little bit further ahead, because we can't focus or we could focus on more than just the oxygen. Uh, we had a quite a, a challenging set of requirements. Um, so power and mass constraints obviously associated with uh, small landers that we have to deal with. A low power, high temperature reactor. Uh, so we're still seeing, even though it's a lower temperature, temperature than other processes, uh, we're still seeing quite high temperatures that we need to comply with. Uh, we need to pick up more than just a small sample uh, for reduction because we want to hit that 50 to 100 gram target of O2. Uh, and obviously, as David just stated, we wanted to keep a degree of, of agnosticism relative to the lander itself. Uh, needless to say, this happens on the moon, which is not the pleasant place to be. Um, just a quick note here in terms of the consortium. So obviously led by Talus Alenia Space UK. Uh, John was supposed to uh, make this presentation today. He's in the audience, but he's kindly deferred to us at AVS. Uh, to present this uh, element, which I'm thankful for. Um, I haven't introduced myself fully, so Artur Futh. I'm a head of mechanical uh, engineering at AVS UK. Uh, also part of the consortium, in no particular order, we have Metalysis, also UK-based. Um, they provide the FFC uh, process, which I think Tim Johnson will present uh, tomorrow, if you have uh, interest in, in that. Uh, the Open University and Luxembourg's own Redwire. Uh, with regards to critical technologies that have been identified, um, you know, mostly focusing around these points there. So pre-processing, how to get that sample in, uh, in a fashion that's compatible with the process that we're using. Uh, reactor and crucible, because obviously it's a very harsh um, and, and opposite conflicting requirements situation. We're operating at a very high temperature, but we need to keep low power. Uh, sample, sample handling, because obviously the moon's a very harsh place to be. We have all sorts of... Um, complex uh, effects that we have to deal with in terms of regolith handling, and then sealing, uh, for which uh, we have a very specific solution, um, which is basically a resettable seal uh, that, that is very insensitive, let's say, to the ongoing or, or cycle situation. Uh, in terms of the payload concept that we ended up with, we have that very nice render there, courtesy of Redwire. Uh, it's just an example. Uh, we have a basically a pre-acquisition camera analysis, so we would take cameras on board with us, uh, to look at the site and pick up the best spot. Uh, we have a flexibility in terms of where we acquire uh, our, our sample from because we did not want a situation where we're just, you know, where we land, that's it. There would be just a, a quick sample uh, grabbing on one of the feet or something. So we end up with a, with a robotic arm to do that. Uh, we have the ability to do batch processing uh, of these samples. So that's very important to demonstrate as well. Um, because if we think about long-term continuity and repeated process, this is something that we need to do. So no one-shot reactors here or sample acquisition, whatever it might be. Uh, as I've stated, we're using the Metalysis FFC process, which as you know or may know, is a solid state process using um, molten salts. Uh, so that allows us to basically keep the temperature down or lower by uh, relative comparison to other uh, processes. Um, but we also see some interesting gains in terms of the insensitivity we have to the mineralogical composition of the sample. Um, and finally, obviously, we have uh, fly-proven analytical instrumentation because we not want to know what goes into the reactor, what comes out of it, and obviously what's being produced as we uh, go on with this reduction process. So just to give you an overview of the operational scenario, so we're assuming we've landed, we've now got our lander nicely ready to, to go. Our payload has been commissioned. Uh, we have the robotic arm, you know, once the position's been identified for sampling, um, which on the end has a, an end effector. In our particular case, we've earmarked a sample uh, brushing mechanism. This allows for a degree of discrimination of the sample that we're picking up. Uh, and then it's also quite an effective means of moving a, a big volume of regolith into our acquisition system. Um, 
We've collected that, we then deliver it to a transfer and processing subsystem. So our particular concept uh, has also that advantage because it's you know, built around the insensitivity of the reduction process. Uh, we're able to, to get by with not a lot of beneficiation done to it. So we have a relatively low effort from that perspective to deal with. And all, uh, quote unquote, that we have to deal with is really the harsh environment um, of handling lunar regolith. We have a means of introducing the, uh, con basically we, we containerize, let's say, that sample. Uh, and we have a means of introducing it into the reactor, um, you know, using that resettable seal, as I mentioned earlier. And, and this is giving us quite, quite a good operational advantage because we can then carry on that reduction process, um, but then carry on with the processing of the next batch. Um, the sample is gonna be reduced uh, so for, nominally we're looking at anywhere between 10 and 20 hour for reduction um, run to, to, to do its, get its job done. Uh, we're getting all those gaseous species being uh, removed uh, through our analytical instrumentation. And then finally, we have a means of extracting the spent, uh, let's say the spent container uh, and move on to the next, uh, next stage of the operation. Um, Relevant things to add here, so obviously this particular uh, demonstration is focused on a nominal mission scenario where we're not really looking for continued operation in the sense of survival, uh, surviving the lunar night and then reinitiating or anything like that, um, nor are we doing anything particularly exotic or sexy with the oxygen that comes out of it. Um, but when we looked at the extended mission uh, profile, we have presented solutions that are quite robust in terms of ensuring that A, we could look at alternative means of, of surviving the night and starting over on, on the next lunar day, uh, but also we have in place One the technologies minute. to do oxygen purification, which is quite relevant because essentially the gas stream that we would see out of this would have a relatively low oxygen concentration, but you know, we have the means in place uh, to get things done. Uh, just a few numbers there, obviously mass, quite, um, quite strict requirements, but we're there or thereabouts. Uh, relevant, I, I think it's an interesting number to have, just the first metric of the kind of, the amount of energy that you would need to produce oxygen uh, at this demonstration level. In conclusion, I think I've said most of the things. Uh, you know, our payload concept meets what it needs to do. Uh, we have tight mass and power requirements that we're able to comply with. Uh, we have a very interesting reduction process supplying uh, or supporting everything. Uh, and also, importantly, we have uh, the development of technology uh, that will ensure European technology uh, independence. Uh, going forward, that's basically the rest of this year and a bit for the next, we're looking at increasing uh, maturity of payload system that's also supported by additionally uh, funded activities that we have on hardware being built and tested. Uh, and we're basically setting in the requirements definition for subsystem level and then support for the follow on phases. So I'd like to thank you all for your time. That, that's it. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I think we have one question. Yeah, just one quick directed question. Directed to... Yes, oh, I mean to both, but... Uh, directed to both of you. I, I think uh, <laughs> Archer can, can answer, or David, but... Uh, so what do you do with the tailings after reducing the material? Uh, sorry, do you mind? What do you do with the tailings of the... Ah, the tailings. So, so we're just going to do, um, basically, the, the idea is to do XRF, XRD analysis to look at the composition. Uh, so obviously, that, that I did not mention, so... This process extracts a lot of the oxygen, has a big potential to extract almost as much oxygen as we want, uh, which would leave behind high metallic content uh, tailings, as you're calling them. And these would be very, very interesting for, you know, whatever you want to do with them. So it's a, it's a nice solid metallic lump that you have, uh, albeit at the, at the expense of a little bit of efficiency on the oxygen extraction, but basically we have both um, outputs, so not just a, a single uh, shot event. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, thank you. Now, our next speaker, I, I'm delighted to say, is here because I can see him in front of me, which is marvelous. <laughs> it's uh, online, it's uh, Michael Hecht from MIT who's going to talk about MOXIE. Welcome, Michael. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted so, you are there. <laughs> yeah, this is exciting. Everything that's gone before is tremendously exciting, and I'm sure the rest of the session will be as well. Uh, I am uh, privileged to be able to represent, as principal investigator, the, the first substantial investment that NASA has made in actually sending 
uh, a resource utilization plant to another planet, and that would be MOXIE. Um, uh, I see my clicker is on, so all I have to do is click. Let's try it. Ah, there we go, look at that. Uh, the first slide, I think I whizzed right by, but that's all right, it was just the title. Okay, um, MOXIE, what is it? Yeah, I, I think probably most of the audience here knows, but I'll go very briefly through it. You need a lot of oxygen on Mars, mostly to take astronaut, a crew of astronauts home to get them off the planet because that ascent rocket breathes a heck of a lot of oxygen to burn its fuel, much more so than the people do. So, you know, this is such a critical technology for a future Mars mission. Uh, NASA believed it was worth, it was important to validate it. Uh, you know, it's kind of audacious to validate it uh, on the planet in situ, and that's what MOXIE is about. It's about one in 200 scale, because as the previous speaker mentioned, we're limited by available power. So that's really all we can do. Um, so we make six to 10 grams of propellant grade oxygen an hour. I say propellant grade, uh, that's equivalent to what you need for humans to breathe. And that rate to give you something tangible uh, is about what, about half of what uh, you are breathing if you're watching this presentation quietly. Um, and uh, it's about what a modest sized tree would make, okay? So anyway, um, I think I just explained this. This is kind of a little bit of a pediatric slide, but I use it for everybody. And just to point out that in general, when you burn fuel, you need an oxidizer. And typically that's oxygen. And burn can mean many things. It can mean a fuel cell. It can mean the human body burning our lunch. Uh, but the oxygen, what we aren't always aware of on, Mar on Earth as Earthlings is that the oxygen we use to burn fuel weighs quite a bit more than the oxygen, than the fuel itself. So for example, to burn seven tons of fuel in an ascent rocket, which we would have to bring from Earth, will take 25 tons of oxygen uh, to burn it up, which we would also have to bring from Earth if we couldn't make it on Mars. And that's why this is the low hanging fruit. That's why this is the first thing that NASA went off after not making fuel from water and other really difficult things. But the low hanging fruit that both is the single biggest thing that we would have to take to Mars with us in a human mission and is the most available thing because we can pull it right out of the atmosphere, which means unlike the previous, uh, you know, what you have to do in the moon, uh, you don't have to dig it up. You just have to, you know, act like a tree and and inhale. Um, as always, I forgot to start my own personal timer, so I will try to finish on time all by myself. Um, okay, let's let's go on then. Just very briefly, and we I could talk about this for the next ten minutes, and I, I'll try not to. The method that we use, which is the, you know not the only way to make oxygen out of CO2. Well, heck, trees do it without without doing this but it was the most mature uh, and it's reliable and obviously it's rugged because it's working on Mars, uh, is what's called solid oxide electrolysis. And the idea is that you have a, a, a ceramic electrolyte that has the property that when you heat it to 800 degrees C, uh, and this is yttrium stabilized zirconia, that's what the YSZ stands for. When you heat it to 800 degrees centigrade, it allows oxygen ions to pass through it and nothing else. So then all you have to do, quote unquote, is, is arrange that when you bring carbon dioxide in, there's appropriate catalyst, mostly nickel, to break that carbon dioxide into CO, carbon monoxide, and an oxygen, uh, you know, a, a, a two minus um, uh, oxygen atom, uh, oxygen ion, and those ions go through here and recombine to make oxygen on the other side, which is a, uh, a perovskite uh, electrode. And then you take a number of these cells and you stack them up to make something that will produce a reasonable amount of oxygen. And it looks like this. And that was developed by the Ceramitech company, in fact. Uh, very important here, um, we're going from CO2 to CO, to carbon monoxide plus oxygen, because if we went all the way to carbon, we would have a mess. And a lot of our effort is to prevent carbon from forming and only take one oxygen atom off of each of those CO2 molecules. So you take this device I just described, you put it in a big structure that insulates it so you won't lose all that heat from this 800 degree C object. So you'll hold it together and it won't, uh, it won't damage itself under the pressure from the flowing gas. Um, and you put it all in a box with springs and then you combine it with a, uh, a compressor, a device to collect 
the oxygen, uh, sorry, the CO2 from the atmosphere, which is about you know, uh, six or seven times as much. And uh, here you are uh, with those two devices next to each other and an electronics box behind it. So I'll quickly walk you through some pictures. So this is what it starts with. Uh, with the, the right, the gold device on the right is the uh, electrolysis system. The smaller black uh, top device on the left is the compressor. And uh, put it in a box, close it up, uh, put the electronics on, nice shiny met, uh, gold uh, surface for thermal control, uh, put the whole thing in a test stand, drop a bell jar over it and put it through all its, in, all its uh, environmental tests and checkouts. And then finally lower the thing into the rover. This was actually uh, you know, the real deal, the rover upside down and Moxie being lo lowered into it and then flipped over, which kind of made, made us, uh, made our, you know, our, our parts flip over a little bit, but it all worked. And um, I'm sure all of you have seen Perseverance arriving on Mars a little over a year ago. And that was quite a celebration of the first Earth year from arriving on Mars. Of course, we're only halfway into the first Mars year. Okay, so our initial plan going in uh, was to operate at different times of the year because they all have different properties. The top line, uh, what I'm showing here is density, which is the most important thing for MOXIE because that tells you how much carbon dioxide this compressor is pulling in. And because you, you can see, uh, this is the, 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 the models for the nighttime and down here, the models for the daytime, which is lower density because it's hotter. Um, and from the extreme, that we haven't quite gotten to yet of uh, the highest density to the lowest density in the, in the daytime, which we just passed, is almost a factor of two. So one of our plans was to take about 10 runs from Moxie and to distribute them throughout uh, the year here as seen. And uh, we've been staying with that plan quite well. Uh, these are the runs that we've, that we've done so far, the eight runs um, uh, of which uh, a few of these were, uh, rat were, were the asterisks, if you can see the tiny asterisks, were not so much just to sample the different weather conditions, but to do specific targeted experiments to learn about things like purity and some of these series resistances in the system. Um, uh, in here, we're now getting into dust storm season. So that's going to look somewhat, more, somewhat interesting as well. Uh, we almost hit a major dust storm in this last run, and we just came in past it. So there's not, I wish there were great pictures to show of Moxie making oxygen. You know, I always wanted to put one of those, a few guys they put in front of the, the uh, auto dealers that, you know, that inflate and do that. Uh, so you could see the oxygen being made. But uh, alas, all we can give you is a curve that shows the total oxygen production as measured by the sensor. You know, we warm up for about two hours. We produce oxygen for about an hour. We make five, six, seven grams, depending on the experiment. And, uh, and then we shut it off and let it cool down. And that uses all the power that the, bat that the rover can give us for any given day. And we wait a month or two to do that again. So about an hour of making oxygen. And um, whoops, uh, cancel that and hit this instead. I almost hit the leave button. That would be bad. All right, so we've learned a few things. I'll just summarize a couple of highlights. One of the biggest concerns is you never, never should run these systems by shutting them off and pulling them down to room temperature, which on Mars is a pretty cold room, uh, and then heating them up against 800 C. Anyone who does this commercially will tell you you never do that. Well, we do that every single time we run. And we worked really, really hard, we being mostly the crew at you know, Ceramitec and JPL, Ceramitec's now called Oxion, uh, to keep the damage from those cycles down to a minimum. And uh, this is showing, uh, these are operational cycles. And the first one we ran on Mars was number nine. We had run eight back on Earth, actually seven back on Earth before we started. Uh, but eight, we didn't measure anything. We just tested the heaters. So from nine to 16, we had, uh, this is a very, very small, you can see this is 0 0.9, 0 0.95, very small degradation. And it shows us we can do this for dozens of times more before we even start uh, uh, having to kind of cut back on, on the rate of oxygen production. So that's a major accomplishment to make this thing robust enough to heat up and cool down over and over and over again. 
The other thing we had to address was whether we get the purity we want. And the answer on this one is, is yes, but, okay. Absolutely, yes, we can get unmeasurable, you know, levels of impurity in the oxygen. And that would all be CO2 because there's nothing else there to contaminate it. Um, if we let the cathode side and the pressure in the cathode side of the electrolysis system, that's the side where the CO2 is, get to be a lot higher than the anode side where the oxygen is, yeah, some of the CO2 will start leaking into the oxygen. Two minutes, so Mike. fortunately, we can control those relative pressures and we can always operate up here and future systems will make to operate up here. But that's one of the lessons learned. Be careful, make sure you have an overpressure on the oxygen side if you don't want to have contamination from CO2. So those are two quick results I'll show you. And one forward looking, I don't know if you can even see this, but on the left is an assessment we did some time ago of where our power is going. And you can see this little blue wedge here. That was the power going to the electrolysis itself. And all the rest of the power was going to, well, a lot of it to compression, a lot of it um, you know, to, to, uh, to electron, to heat loss actually through the system. But we always expected that these numbers would go way down when we simply did nothing more than making a large version. Okay, most of this is because we had to squeeze this all into such a small space that we couldn't do these things efficiently. We have a graduate student, Eric Hinterman, whose uh, thesis defense starts in two minutes, as it turns out, uh, talk about timing, who spent his dissertation studying what that next generation system would look like. And as you can see, well over half by his models and his estimates of the scaled up system, which would feature a stack that actually has been built at Oxion Energy, uh, over half of that energy would go into electrolysis and another, the second biggest wedge is something we didn't even consider with Moxie. It's liquefaction to fill up the tank. So this will be an extraordinarily efficient process uh, when we build that next generation. And that is great news. Um, the mission proceeds. We landed around here. We spent about an Earth year exploring the base of Jezero. And then we just spent a few weeks hightailing it up here to the Delta. Uh, which is uh, where the rivers, you know, uh, purportedly fed uh, the, the great the lake in, in Jezero Crater. And we are literally also just starting our investigation in the last few days of, of this river delta area. And it's truly exciting phase for the Perseverance mission, as well as for MOXIE. I will leave you with that and an acknowledgement of some of our partners. Um, and thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions if there's any time. Thank you so much, Michael, for that wonderful talk about MOXIE. Thank you, Mike. Yes, questions. so we, we had questions, but I think you answered them already in, in your last slide. So maybe I think we better move to the next talk. It's okay with uh, Oh, good. Then I'm going to run off to Eric's thesis oral. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we'll keep our eyes glued for what happens next <laughs> with the and but okay. questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next... Our next talk is actually on site. It's Adam McSweeney from ESA once more, who's going to talk about uh, Mars Ice Access Mission. It's almost a tongue twister. <laughs> Prospecting Round Ice Institute for Future Human Mission Planning. Great, thank you. Um, I maybe start with a small apology because I missed the memo that we should use a dark background. I know it's a really long day looking at this screen, so um, if it's really problematic, I do have a pair of shades. So um, <laughs> raise your hand and let me know if it's really getting too much. I can, um, see, I can see our technological team are asking you to stand closer to the microphone. Is this okay? For the benefit of uh, everybody online. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Adam McSweeney. I'm a systems engineer in the Future Mars Studies team uh, at Aztec. Uh, we are currently studying a range of different Mars mission concepts, and this is just one of them. So an ice drilling mission um, with the direct purpose to benefit planning for future human exploration. Let's see, does this work? Next. The green one, apparently. It's a big green button, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps they're, I'm not sure where you have to direct it to. <laughs> where is the receiver? Where is it? Where do I go? Yeah. <laughs> Could somebody from the tech team help with the slides? There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and we thank you, tech team, because we have the dark slides. Thank you. Okay, so uh, quickly then. Um, 
if we want to bring human crews back from Mars, and we do want to do that, um, the most valuable use of the resources that are there are to produce propellant for the crew return. Um, this is actually following quite nicely on from Mike Heck's last talk. It's a lot of similarities there. Um, when, when we think about the propellant that we need to bring crew home, we commonly refer to uh, methalox uh, propellant, so, so, so methane and oxygen. Now, there's two primary resources that we have on Mars, or should I say reserves on Mars that we can use. And that is the CO2 that's abundant in the atmosphere, as um, highlighted by, by Mike in his, his last, last talk. But also, we, we, we start to think about the possibility of using the water ice or water deposits that might be available around the planet. And uh, the key message here really is that if you want to produce all of your propellant, if it's um, uh, methane and oxygen on the planet Mars, you need to get your hydrogen from somewhere. And that's, we think, OK, the, the water that's, that's uh, available on the planet. So this is just, um, uh, uh, again, ties in quite nicely with, uh, with, the, with the previous speaker. Just wanted to give a really quick example of the, the scale of, of how much we can reduce our departure mass for human missions by um, exploiting, okay, water on Mars in addition to the atmosphere. So um, as we see, we get an enormous benefit, uh, maybe a factor of three or so from, from, from utilization of the, the um, of the O2 in the atmosphere because you can produce all that oxidizer that you need. But if you want to go with the full hog and create everything absolutely, then we need the water access. And we, we, we think that that can give us a, a, a reduction in our departure mass on Earth of about you know, a factor of five to six. So um, I hope you're motivated and you think that this is, okay, really important, something we need to consider uh, going forwards and what, why this is a motivation for why we want to go and find ice on the planet Mars. But actually, we already have found ice on the planet Mars, and we have uh, been there and we've touched it. So um, in 2007, the Phoenix mission launched, um, following from observations from the Odyssey uh, mission, that they were seeing hydrogen abundances around the North Pole of Mars. And so uh, the Phoenix mission was sent to explore this, this environment in the Northern Plains. And they found ice very quickly. So only on Sol 5, they returned back what is known as, I think, the, uh, the holy cow picture, which was when the um, thruster plume from the, from the landing system revealed this white uh, substance beneath the surface, which they, they, they quickly, okay, determined was water ice. And um, it was really a fantastic example of, okay, following indications and actually going down, ground truthing that the ice is there and that enabling further great discoveries. Now, um, the, the point I want to make here is that, yes, we know that water is present on Mars and it's there in the poles. The poles are not necessarily the best place to send people when we send them there for the first time. This is because of poor uh, illumination conditions, poor thermal conditions, and also the delta Vs. The, the cost of access is pretty high. So, okay. But what is important is uh, in the recent years, we're seeing uh, more and more evidence from orbital missions indicating the presence of water ice near the surface in locations that humans might access. So this is around the mid-latitudes and even um, astonishingly in some papers, you know, down towards the equator. So we have two charts here, one from the, um, from the swim team where they have uh, corroborated a range of different uh, data sets from different missions to get a uh, consistency maps to understand, okay, where we think ice may be in the mid-latitudes. And the figure on the left is actually from um, ESA's Trace Scouts Orbiter mission. Uh, where the friend instrument is revealing um, hydrogen hotspots around the equator, which, which we're believing could be permafrost oases. So it's really significant that these, these potential resources are there, but um, before we can actually use them to benefit for future human missions, we need to, well, we need to actually go there and see that it really is there. And moreover, we need to understand what are the properties of these resources, and can we use them in our, in our future systems? So, for planning purposes. Now, if I get on to the Mars Ice Access mission, which I also have trouble saying oftentimes, um, <laughs> this is a, a mission that has um, currently been derived from um, our ESA strategy roadmap, Terra Novae, which was released last year, and I strongly encourage you to go out and see it because it's, it's available online. Now, with our internal studies and from the roadmap, we have derived three top-level objectives for the Mars Ice Access mission. Uh, first of all, we want to go to one of these locations where we believe water ice is there, and we want to verify its presence through drilling down into the near subsurface. Once we're there, we then want to characterize its physical and chemical properties for the purposes of you know, benefit, ben benefiting the de development and design of these systems that will hopefully exploit that resource one day in the future. And while we're there, to, um, to, 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 to continue our, our um, 
uh, experience and heritage with you know, space resources and uh, ISRU demonstration missions, we want to have some level of ISRU demonstration payload on board the mission. Now, um, I showed you before the holy cow image when we, when we touched down. I've had to speak to some of my French colleagues and you know, I'm hoping that with this first objective we'll have our own um, uh, holy cow moment, but instead of holy cow, because we're Europeans, it, I understand the correct term might be lavash, you know, when we, when we get that thing coming along, so, <laughs> great. Um, is this, I think I'm done here. Great, okay, very quickly, just to give you a, a, an overview of what we've done on this, um, this, this mission concept so far, because we are pretty new with all of this. Um, we had a CDF study um, uh, towards the end of last year called Armadillo. Uh, which was investigating just different payload options that we might have for this mission. Um, we then followed that with some internal studies within the future Mars studies team, that's the Mars X team, in case you're wondering what that is, uh, to understand and further consolidate the results of the CDF study to, to further refine the objectives and think what we could fit in with the programmatic envelope of the, the 2030s, which is when we're targeting to launch this thing. And right now, we have an ITT, which is out for a mission level study uh, based on the findings of what we have so far. So this is just a, a, a quick uh, roadmap of where we are and where we're going. And okay, in our early studies so far, this is just to give a, a brief idea of the kind of mission architecture that we are envisioning for the, for the concept. So um, if we start with thinking about the payload, so there's a number of core modules that we need on there. So we're gonna have some um, kind of drill on board, which uh, we're looking to, to build on heritage gained from ExoMars and Prospect. Um, very important is the sample process, processing and distribution uh, systems that you need for the handling of these icy materials in, um, in, in the Mars ambient environment so that the, the ice doesn't physically sublimate away because the air pressure is so low. Uh, then, of course, we have the demo resource utilization model, uh, module, sorry, and uh, a range of different instruments on board for our scientific surveys right there. Uh, we are allocating or estimating that the payload mass of this system is going to be somewhere between the 100 and 150 kilogram mark, uh, which, okay, looking at historical data from Mars landers and the kind of technologies we think, will give us a ballistic entry uh, vehicle of about a mass of one ton, so 1,000 kilograms. With that in mind, we reckon that we can launch using the Ariane 6-2, and we found good opportunities in 2033 and 2035. So this is really a, a, a high, high level view of how we think this mission is going to look. And uh, yes, okay. Uh, oh, importantly, this, this point on the end, we, we, we're anticipating as well to use um, solar rays for our primary um, power generation. And we want to target um, a region in the Northern Hemisphere that will allow us to have a relatively short mission landing hopefully in the spring and running through to, to the end of summer, then we expect uh, darkness to come and the mission will be no longer to run. So, um, okay, just uh, quickly then to say, a lot of our studies that we've done previously and the, the pre-phase A study that we are, we are uh, targeting now, um, we're looking into the idea of option exploration. We really want to understand well the trade space that exists for, for these missions. So. Uh, I mentioned previously there's the Armadillo CDF report um, with a yeah, creative logo that we, we always have for our internal concurrent design facility studies. Uh, that's available now, so uh, reach out to me and I can, I can send that to you if you're, if you're, if you're keen to read up more. Uh, but also on the, on the left-hand side, we just have a really high-level look at some of the, the key mission trades that we want to consider for this concept going forward. So really, we're, we're trading uh, different concepts and different ideas, and um, this is going to be the main focus of the... the um, the pre-phase A when we, when we kick it off sometime in the summer. And I think that is actually uh, it, um, short and sweet on this, so uh, three key messages I just want to, uh, to give to you. Uh, again, if you're gonna remember anything, remember these three things, please. Uh, we at ESA, we're studying an ice uh, drilling mission with the sole purpose of benefiting future human exploration. Um, you can find this, this mission first sort of outlined in the Terra Nova strategy roadmap, which you can see uh, on this link here, um, yeah, not interactive. We have the Armadillo CDF study and we've done internal studies looking at payloads. Um, I can, there's only so much I can say on these, you know, in these uh, quick, quick talks we have here today. Uh, and thirdly, we are preparing for a um, industrial pre-phase A study um, to explore and define the, the baseline concept that exists. And uh, yeah, you can see the invitation to the tender that exists out there now. Um, very quickly before I recap, um, because Mars Ice Access mission is quite a mouthful, we always think about creative names for missions in the, in the team. And, um, armadillo, the armadillo CDF study, the name was actually derived from, um, well, what is everyone's favorite space drilling movie? Armageddon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, okay, it was uh, some, some complicated acronym that I can't remember the top of my head, but um, 
One idea that I was hoping we could have gone forward with, but I was told not to for contractual reasons, was um, boreholes for resource utilization and characterization, exploring water ice, and looking for life in situ. Or Bruce Willis. Yeah, okay. um, and with that, yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. So we have one question from the chat about uh, your opinion on the impurities that you may find in a, you know, water after mining, and how is this going to impact your water splitting step? Well, th this is the point of the mission. We don't know until we go there. This is really why um, we, we want to study. So I mean, it's uh, it's unlikely we, we land and we see um, uh, ice in its, its pure form that we can just melt and put in a glass of water. There might be all kinds of nasty stuff in there that we need to learn about. So. Um, yeah, I don't know, I've not been to Mars, but um, this is why we want to do the mission really, to understand those questions, to de-risk the planning for the systems that would hopefully use that resource reserve one day in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, thank, thank you, you so much. That's really great. Another round of applause, please, for Adam and his story. And while he's regaining his seat, I'd like to ask you all to stand up because it's been a very long session and we've got one small thing to go and I feel most of us are losing the feeling in our legs. So just stand up and have a stretch for two minutes in any way you want to and nobody's looking at you. Please, <laughs> Just have a stretch because it's been a very long session but so interesting and such exciting talks as well. Really, really fantastic talks. And I know that we all wish we'd have longer to ask questions because each talk deserves an hour in itself.